This is Blue Sunshine Film Thoughts. Happy Spooktober! If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. I try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking this fast once I get into the video itself. Now, this contains spoilers. I might bring up some of the other work by the people who made it, but I'm only going to be spoiling this movie in this video. Now, let's see. So, yeah. Content warning and or trigger warning. Sorry, I have a hard time understanding the distinction, but I do really respect how necessary the terms are, and I want to cover my bases. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content for this movie. Death by burning, attempted child murder, dying during surgery, losing your mind due to drug use. And I want to make clear, I don't have a problem with violence and gore in general. The Thing is one of my favorite horror movies and movies in general. I also love Cronenberg's The Fly, Videodrome, etc. Now, let's see. Yeah, personally, I don't think it's wrong to put violence in fiction, except for the following, well, exceptions. If it could encourage xenophobia, and if it could make people think that violence is a solution, there are almost no problems that it solves in real life. And I actually appreciate that in this movie, the violence is all committed by, you know, there's, there's a little self-defense. You know, Zippy defends himself a few times, but the people initiating violence are the... I guess I should probably come up with something to call them. I've seen some people call them maniacs, but that's maybe not the best. I feel like that's probably ableist. Let's see. The the acid heads, I guess. Let's let's go with the the blue sunshiners. The blue sunshiners are usually the ones to initiate violence, and in fact, there at the end, the solution to the problem is not to kill the killer which is very often the case in horror movies, keeping in mind that I love the genre of horror, it is to subdue the, the killer. And in fact, the problem is solved by involving authorities who are, you know, who have the training and equipment to solve the situation. And as soon as they trust Zippy and understand the actual problem, that's, you know, so... Let's see. Now, I don't have a problem with disturbing and upsetting material in general. Monsters is one of my favorite movies. And let's see. Now, I probably will swear at least some in this video, maybe in quoting the movie, for example. And. This video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MST3K riff tracks and other jokes. And, yeah, to go over the, the first section is thoughts that I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary or live tweeting with a like. The second section is thoughts that I had before watching, including my responses to various YouTube videos, including trailers, analysis, etc., DVD extras. And this is also the section for anything I thought of entirely on my own that wasn't in response to something and that I had thought of well before watching. And the old time codes are in the description box. And in the final section, I get into stuff I think it is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, and the Wikipedia. And before recording this vlog, I had read all... Yes, actually all of it, and I've definitely forgotten at least some of what I read since I prepared for these weeks ahead, sometimes a month or more. If you're not interested in the contents of all three sections, I invite you to only watch the ones you are interested in. And let's see. I really appreciate that the movie does have empathy for you know, the blue sunshiners. I, I suppose you could say that Ed Fleming and Wayne Mulligan are not particularly 
you know, appealing, but you do, yeah, you know, the, the, you, you have, you know, the, the, for example, Franny is actually introduced as being very likable. Everybody seems to like him. And like when the, you know, they, they, some of them at least express genuine concern when he runs off. Let's see, we've got, and Wendy, I'd say she has a lot of humanizing moments. You know, obviously, when she's talking about her headaches and, and these things, it is also this sort of, it's also building tension. You know, we, we realize she might be a blue sunshiner, but you do actually sympathize with her. But, but yeah, Wayne ultimately is, you know, I mean, at least, you know, to be fair, he does think, excuse me, he does think that, he does think that Alicia isn't actually with Zippy. She claims that they're just friends. And, I mean, I guess at most, you know, he's, he's kind of aggressive with her. I mean, I mean, before the, you know, obviously he's very aggressive once the, once the damage fully kicks in in the discotheque, but, you know, before that he's kind of pushy in wanting to, you know, get a date with her, but I suppose that is essentially the the worst thing you can say, and and he lies about Zippy when talking to the cop, but you know, but but certainly Ed is. You know, he clearly cares more about if his political career might be harmed by, you know, Blue Sunshine than if he can actually help, you know, any of the people the, that Blue Sunshine has, you know, affected. Now, let's see. And... Yeah, since, since it does show empathy, I think they made the right choice for the movie. At the end of the day, it's not really... I mean, something that I will admit I didn't realize either, and clearly, you know, when you read the reviews, a lot of people didn't realize Jeff Lieberman, who wrote and directed this, is not saying that acid is going to turn you into a killer. He was making... It's basically a satire of the anti-drug, you know, messaging, similar to, you know, some of the DVDs and Blu-rays that you can, you know, if, if you buy Blue Sunshine on DVD or Blu-ray, you might get, oh, just real quick, I know some people have the Blu-ray, I only have the DVD, so I don't have access to, you know, I don't have access to all of the, the special features that others did, so I'm not going to be commenting on them all. And, yes, if you buy Blue Sunshine on DVD or Blu-ray, you might get the, what's it called? The Ringer, which is a satire on the anti-drug PSAs. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that he liked to, to comment on. So the, the movie is not supposed to... You know, for one thing, it's not supposed to be taken as an actual, you know, Jeff Lieberman is not saying with this movie that this is the kind of thing that could happen. He's saying, wouldn't it be ridiculous if, you know, let's, let's actually for a moment, for, for 98, 89, sorry, 89 minutes, take seriously the ridiculous myths about drug use and let's build a murder mystery around it, you know, or murder, it's a mystery that involves murder, I guess, technically a murder mystery, you don't know the perpetrator, which you do here, but, you know, so, but, but yeah, the, the movie definitely has empathy for basically every character, and, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think it's necessary I'm not saying that young people who make mistakes, that we shouldn't examine that kind of thing, but I do think it's very important to not just 
you know, let, not let it, you know, just become finger pointing. It's important that we actually think about these things, even if you're going to be completely cynical and say that you don't care about young people because you aren't one anymore. Think about whether or not, if, if you just do finger pointing, if you don't look at what causes problems, you're never going to solve them. And just saying young people do stupid things is not going to solve anything. The movie, you know, ultimately the movie doesn't really go into why they did acid, but it does show that, you know, the people who did do acid, some of them, you know, the, the, they didn't, like, it didn't destroy who, it didn't destroy them. They, they did manage to have a future afterwards. And I do, th you know, others have noted that obviously with F. Fleming, the, the part of the idea is obviously that he is a, he's a hypocrite. He used to be a, a hippie. And now he's a crit. And when, you know, he used to be a hippie saying, you know, down with the system, there's even, you know, there's, there's that excellent photograph that Franny took where he's wearing this, you know, he's, he's dressed as Uncle Sam, but in, for, from the famous I Want You poster, but instead of pointing at the viewer, he's flipping off the viewer, you know, so he had no respect for government. I'm not saying that everybody should have complete, you know, we shouldn't have complete respect for government. We should examine what they're doing, but he had zero respect. And now he's saying he should be running the government. You know, he's, he's running for Congress. And I want to say her name is Wendy says he might even become president. So, you know, there's obviously some hypocrisy there, but these are people, you know, they wear suits. They have normal jobs today. So it's not that, you know, keeping in mind that Hollywood used to demonize drug use. You know, when you look at, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of horror movies where the, the, the problem is that someone did some drugs or, or something, you know, that led to something bad. And obviously sometimes it does. Sometimes drug use leads to something very bad many very bad things, but this movie is not interested in just judging people for doing drugs. Now, let's see. And, yeah. Personally, I try to approach every movie with as much empathy as possible for every character and the people working on it. Some movies make that difficult. This is not one of them. Now, I probably will be saying at least some negative things in this, so I do want to make absolutely clear. I try not to review films that fall into genres that I don't like. I realize an argument can be made in favor of talking about genres that you don't like, but it's not really what I want to do with these videos. I don't particularly like the idea of giving a negative review to something where it sounds like what I'm saying is, you know, I don't like this genre, so that means it's a bad movie. I want to try to examine what the movie does right and what it could maybe do better. Now, let's see. So, yes, once again, I love horror. So, a number of horror movies trend to, tend to treat, yeah, the horror genre tends to treat women negatively. Some, you know, many times they're disposable, there are a lot of misogynist tropes. They're useless, they're not strong, they're sexualized against their will and or they're only there for that purpose. They're sexually assaulted or raped without film exploring the effects of it, etc. And really, several of the, the, you know, Alicia certainly is a very strong character. She makes active decisions that really help out. She leads the cop to Wayne and helps, you know... She helps enable Zippy to get to Wayne. And, you know, she saves Zippy with the, the you know, by increasing the audio to, to really, to, you know, I guess the right word is to trigger, to trigger, 
you know, so that he'll run off, leaving Zippy alone. And once again, we have a lot of empathy for Wendy. There's not really any negative depiction of women in this. So, yeah, again, that's great. And, yeah, I, I really appreciate the, you know, I don't know, I guess maybe it wasn't as much of a thing in the 70s as, you know, 80s and, and 90s and on, but the movie really doesn't sexualize the the women, the, you know, and it's not, you know, the, the they're, they're not like innocent virgins or something, you know, but they're, they're not defined as being, you know, really, really sexual. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with sexuality, but a lot of horror movies use the sexuality of women just to, you know, just for allure, just to, to you know, to, to draw in a, you know, yeah, straight male viewers without using it for anything. Which, once again, as I said, Monster, one of my favorite movies, that movie is not shying away from sex and sexuality, but it uses it, it examines and explores it. But I guess, yeah, so that, let's see, and, right, and the, yes, yeah, so other, other groups that, horror movies often don't treat well, ethnic minorities are often made out to be dangerous because they're different, there's not really any ethnic minorities in this, are there? I don't think... I think it's a fairly, it's, mo most of the characters are white. And, yeah, and a lot of horror movies show, you know, those with mental problems as being dangerous rather than frequently the victims of violence. I guess, yeah, the, the, ultimately the movie does still do the, the thing where, where someone who's mentally ill is, is dangerous. And... I, I realize it would make for a very different movie, but I do think an interesting horror movie could be built from saying, you know, these people did acid. And, like, imagine that if instead of them starting to go around killing people, the Blue Sunshiners, like, maybe they went catatonic or, like, you know, some something where they weren't dangerous to others, but where some, you know, but yeah, it would make it a very different movie. I'd like to see that movie, actually. Maybe it, maybe it already exists. Please put the title in the comments if a movie like that exists, because I do think that would be really interesting. And I have seen, I'm not sure I've seen a movie where it's drugs, but I have seen movies where someone, you know, suddenly becomes, for example, catatonic. You know, something bad happens to them. And, you know, sometimes it's a result of something they did, sometimes it's something other people did, but, but, but yeah, again, you know, I do think it is well worth noting that they didn't do it on purpose. You know, the Blue Sunshiners did not think that this is what it would lead to. Now, and horror movies... You know, it's important for a horror movie not to overexpose the threat. And this movie does do a, a good job of that. Ultimately, like, I didn't time it, but once, f from the moment that someone is, you know, I guess, let's use snaps. From the moment that someone snaps to the moment that that particular blue sunshiner is killed or you know, in Wayne's case, Trank, Tranked. They don't have a lot of screen time between, and, and in, you know, really with both Franny and Wendy, very little time passes at all between when they snap and when they die. So, yeah, the movie does a really great job on that. And, you know, I think there's the right amount of violence 
I think the suspense is really well handled. As I mentioned, I'm going to criticize the movie, but I'm going to try to, you know, actually, yeah, let me briefly say something else first. So, I got this movie on sale, so anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I also do not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how this compares to what it's adapting, other movies like it, other work of Jeff Lieberman. I don't have any kind of personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. And sorry about the bit about adapting, sometimes I forget to read a little bit ahead and like I mentioned, these are very standardized notes. A lot of movies are adaptations. I'm not... If this is one, then I haven't heard anything about it. Now, I first watched this movie in the year 2013. I've watched it, I think, only once since. Before now watching it today, right now, before now vlogging about it. So, in case that was unclear, I have by now watched it three times total. My making jokes in this should not be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad, me wanting to make light of a subject, or etc. I simply find it very difficult not to MST3K and overanalyze everything I'm watching. Yeah, that was where that end sentence should end. Now, let's see. Yes, so. Now, my own quote-unquote film critic rating for this I think ultimately I'm going to land on eight missing doses of blue sunshine that a task force specifically for blue sunshine is still trying to track down out of 10. And my personal rating is nine missing blue doses of missing sunshine. Blech. I'll get there eventually. Missing doses of blue sunshine out of 10. So, yeah, please do keep in mind, when I criticize this, I probably will say at least some negative things about it. I really do love this movie, and I'm definitely going to be watching it again. And it really, like all three times I watched it, it really, I find it to be such a gripping movie that really just, you know, it just, it, it doesn't let go, it doesn't let up for the entire runtime, and it doesn't let go until, I don't know, days, weeks later. You know, I, I keep thinking about it, It which, which I think is, I think a lot of the best horror movies are the ones where you keep thinking about it long after it's over. You know, I, I'm not saying that it's a general rule, but I would definitely say some bad horror movies, you can tell that they're bad by the moment that the moment that the movie is done playing, you forget about it pretty, you know, not very long after. I guess I should briefly state my opinion on drugs. I personally never used drugs, and I probably won't ever, but the war on drugs was clearly started to punish political opponents. It's still in part used for that, you know, t today it allows some authorities get away with profiting off drugs and for them to avoid having to compete with, you know, people without power for those profits. You know, the war on drugs is not about trying to find a solution to the problems posed by completely unregulated drugs. I don't think all drugs should be equally available, but regulation would prevent a lot of the problems. And something like marijuana should be treated similar to alcohol or tobacco when it comes to laws. I don't blame drug users for the problems they experienced from their drug use, given how addictive it is. And honestly, if there was better mental health care, a lot of these people would never have even started, at least initially, using drugs. And let's see, you know, and and like I mentioned, it, this is in part a satire, but I do want to make absolutely clear for anyone watching this: the supposed effects of blue sunshine are not credible, even remotely, you know, and again, 
as a satire. It's not supposed to be. Anyway. But, but yeah, I still, you know, yeah, never mind. But yeah, just to, yeah, the, the satire thing, I just want to make sure I say everything. So some of this is going to be repeat information. Apologies for that. Did I almost say apologize for that? Please apologize to yourself for me repeating information to you. Something that a lot of us who watched the movie missed is that apparently the movie is not actually saying that this is something that will happen or even could happen if you do acid. It's making fun of what the government was saying will happen if you do acid. Similar to how the first Starship Troopers movie is not actually in favor of war. It's a satire on media in media in favor of war. And that brings us to the first section. Oh, it took me 26 minutes to do the intro. Notes taken while watching. So, right from the opening seconds, we hear those effective notes of the music, really setting the tone beautifully. And that shot of the of the blue full moon really is so haunting. It just yeah. I would say that the doctor has great bedside manner, but honestly, he's kind of handsy. But clearly, the patient does really like him, trust him. And she asks if he's going to cut her up again. And I have to admit, I had... its It's been some months between today watching the movie and the last time I watched the movie. I had kind of blocked out of my memory that the patient that dies on the table was this sweet, you know, middle-aged woman who likes the doctor and who the doctor really likes. You know, that just really just, you know, jams the knife in and twists the blade. And we see that he has a headache, and we get a close-up of his eyes before we know what the eyes or headaches even mean. But, you know, once you realize it, it's like, ah, oh. man, Jason is annoying kid, an annoying kid to babysit. Now, yeah, we have the line, he's running for Congress. Maybe someday he'll even be president. Later we realize just how hypocritical it is for him to now work within the system after he after decrying it for just ten years earlier. And let's see. And yeah, the the you know the little girl being and you know because as Wendy is reading the story of Rapunzel, the little girl pulls at her hair and some of it comes out. Yikes. And we see that blue full moon again. Blue blue moon. Blue moon. And the cop's wife blames herself as way too many women do when they have problems with men. I do appreciate how understanding we're you know apparently that's like the neighbor from across the street. He is when, I'm sorry, I forget her name, but Johnny's wife is when, you know, when she talks to him about the problems. And suddenly John is just standing there, very creepy. And we get a close-up of Johnny's eyes and the camera goes up to the blue moon again and we get the title both written and spoken by the parrot, which is apparently director Jeff Lieberman's voice. And that is of a great, like the, the, ah, what's it called? You know, we, we already saw the parrot because it was on one of the, one of the kids had it on his shoulder before. And then when Johnny is staying there, it flies into shot and sits on his shoulder and, you know, starts talking. And then when we see the title, it repeats the, yeah. I mean, it is, it, you know, I, I saw someone point out just how, like, it's, 
it's incredible that the movie literally has a major plot point B that, you know, I mean, Zippy literally finds out about Blue Sunshine by the parrot saying it. You know, that's how he... And, and without... If he hadn't heard those two words, I'm not sure, you know, how would he even have really pieced this whole thing together? You know, so the... You know, he he might still have gone to check on you know at at Franny's. Was that Franny's place? It, it, let's go with that Franny's place and seeing that it said Blue Sunshine under Ed Fleming's picture, but he wouldn't have known that there was a connection between the you know Blue Sunshine and the Blue Sunshineers. So since he's not referring to them as that. I like that Jerry gets a few moments before we realize that he's going to be the protagonist. At first, you know, he's filmed like he's a face in the crowd. You know, and I saw... I'm, I'm not the first person to note that about the movie. You know, he's not the only one who gets a couple of character moments at the party. And, you know, the guests are stunned and, you know, some of them laugh at, you know, Franny, excuse me, being bald under the hairpiece. I gotta remember, he's not called Frankie. That's because he was doing, and now I, re now I can't remember the singer's full name, but he was Frank Sinatra. That's it. He was doing Frank Sinatra, so one of them calls him Frankie. And his real name is Franny. So, th yeah. I might make mess that up, mix that up. Those, those do both work. And... You know, and the th yeah, the three women left at the party talk about how weird it was with the shaved head. I appreciate that they do assume that it must be him shaving his head because it, it is... You know, again, like once you realize that the movie is satire, there are... A number of little nods to that in the movie, like in dialogue and such, like characters just don't really believe that what's happening is actually happening. You know, he's he's basically, you know, what, once you realize that it's satire, Jeff Lieberman might as well be like jumping into frame, you know, with a, with a big banner over him that says do you get it like you know see how ridiculous the the this concept actually is you know let's let's play it straight but come on it's ridiculous we all know what the government told us about acid is absolutely ridiculous now you know i i i forgot to note it where i noted about the satire but apparently you know jeff lieberman himself has taken I forget if it was acid specifically, but definitely he's he's done some drugs and he's not like ashamed of it or worried that something will happen or something. You know, he talks about that freely in like interviews and such when talking about this movie. Franny repeatedly shoves the woman back into the prior fireplace. Really horrifying. Probably one of the most effective kills I've seen in a horror movie of ones that are not bloody or gory. And honestly, by some standards, it wouldn't even be considered a violent on-screen kill since he's not, you know, he's not hitting her with anything. You know, there there are people in this movie that are killed with violence, but he's, yeah, but really, really horrifying. And again, like I, you know, when the last time I watched it some months ago, yeah, I must have just blocked it out because the moment that it happened, I remembered that that's, you know, when I watched the, the 23rd, like, as I was watching it months ago, because we've already, we've seen that there's a fireplace. We know that the fireplace exists in this place. And we see him come back and he, you know, he picks her up and he carries her. And it's like, for for a few seconds, like, my mind is going... He's not going to throw her into, oh my, he threw her into the fireplace. You know, that's just, 
it's such a horrifying and it's such a it's such a great like you know Jeff Lieberman takes things that we are comfortable with and twists them into something cruel and awful everybody has like been at a get together of some kind where you're around people that you're comfortable or you know that that you trust on on some level you know even like i'm not a very social person but even i have been at get togethers where there are people there that i'm not like you know i'm not worried are going to hurt me and i mean a, a fireplace who you know I, I guess not everybody but a lot of like when you see a fireplace in a movie, you don't immediately think someone's gonna die in there. You know, you you think, oh yeah, that's, that's the way they're heating that house or that that building. You know, or not not the entire building, but the the room at the very least. You know, you don't think of it as something. You know, on on some level, you realize that it's dangerous, of course. But everybody knows that they're dangerous. It's not like someone's going to accidentally walk into a fireplace, you know. Like, hypothetically, if, if there are kids in the room, you, you obviously watch them carefully to make sure they don't accidentally, you know, they don't get too close to the fireplace. But, no, it, it's, but, but suddenly you have someone that, you know, he's, these people have trusted him for years, and the fireplace is there to heat the room, and suddenly he's throwing them into the fireplace you know that is legitimately yeah and and the we we ultimately we see we only see him put one of the women in there and then he attacks the other two but then when zippy gets there i'm not 100 percent sure but i think that if you look at carefully at the fireplace you can see that there are three you know three different bodies in there so yeah it, it's possible that he killed you know, maybe, maybe he softened them up a bit with the, you know, he started going after one of them with the, was it the the fireplace poker, I want to say, you know, so, you know, if they, yeah, just really, really horrifying kill. And Franny, for some reason, hid behind, I think there's the, like the curtains until Zippy goes up to, to move the curtains from in front of, without knowing that. Franny was there. That was kind of a ridiculous jump scare. But again, I I guess you know it is this thing of like you know the the ridiculous things that the government claimed doing drugs would make you do. So Franny wasn't quite dead after being run over. He ha did have one more ridiculous jump scare in him before he died. But you know. The, the I, I think it is another instance of the, the drug, you know, Blue Sunshine doing ridiculous things to these people. And honestly, someone seeming to have died and then getting up roaring like that is legitimately scary. It's very unnatural. We can tell that there's something very wrong there. It's plain and simple not supposed to happen like that. You know, I mean, it's, you know, we, we have the same shocked reaction that we would have if he suddenly, like, jumped into the air and took off flying you know just it it goes beyond what can actually happen you know, i swear at some point i probably i will probably say some negative things about this movie that are that i can't chalk up to oh well it's supposed to be you know i'm, I'm not gonna make any excuses for zolman king's performance i'm i'm not sure i'm gonna talk that much about it but you know, it's not. If you read reviews of this, many people point out that his performance is really out there, and his characterization is also. You know, he's a frustrating character to follow, as someone who's trying to prove that he didn't kill anyone because he keeps incriminating himself. It might look kind of silly the way you know the the truck driver. You know, he's like you know. He he shoots Zippy once, but then the next time he's standing there, he's like, you know, he he seemingly like can't hold the gun still while shooting repeatedly at Jerry. But then that is how a lot of people react when, you know, trying to to shoot a person. It's it's a very unpleasant 
thing to directly violently harm a person. I like that, you know, Alicia like says, I'm gonna I'll talk to my lawyer before I talk to you. And the cop is like, damn TV shows. How the hell did you get yourself shot? I'll give you a hint. It involved a gun and another person. So this is what it takes to get to see you. It does make sense that David couldn't be at the party since we've already been told he's extremely busy at the hospital. It's likely that he was invited, but he had to decline, you know. And Zippy finds that David lost some hair. I really love the the him being used as a red herring because the movie doesn't overplay it. It keeps hinting that he's a blue sunshiner, but there's none none of the things that we see with him. Like like once you realize he's not a blue sunshiner, he says that he never touched acid. It's not like there's something that we saw that's like, well, then why was, you know, like when you, there are a number of movies where once the, you know, one, once the plot twist is revealed, you think back and it's like, well, then why were they saying this or doing that? And it's like, for the audience's benefit so that we wouldn't suspect them, you know, and in this case, I mean, at the end of the day, David is losing some hair. He's, you know, he's dealing with all these headaches and he, you know, his, his temper, he, he really seems to lose his temper during the surgery. Those things, you know, I, maybe not the hair loss, but certainly the other things that's, you know, he's, he's an overworked doctor. He's, you know, and, and. Yeah, so, so the, uh, let me think, what's the word? Hair loss, could that be stress-based? I'm not 100% sure, I, I, uh, I, I don't know enough to say for sure, but certainly it's, you know, it is a thing that can happen, and, and he also, he hadn't lost a crazy amount of hair, you know. It would have been pretty ridiculous if Wendy turned out to not be a blue sunshine, considering how much hair we see her lose. So, yeah, once again, I'm not sure how much I'm personally going to comment on Zalman King's performance. You know, others have pointed out it tends to be either really over the top or very low key. I'm not sure I really have much to add about it, and I'm not sure I'm great at talking about acting performances anyway. I no longer take anything stronger than aspirin. You know that, Zippy. Setting up that he did used to do at least some drugs as, you know, red herring. Since, you know, we soon realize it is about drugs. And, you know, he never did claim to take blue sunshine. He did other drugs, but not blue You know, he, he says he didn't touch acid at all. So, again, it's it's a great red herring. Like, it would have been ridiculous if he had said, you know, I stay away from acid today, and then later he says, I never touched acid. It's like, well, that's not what you said before, you know, but they do a really great job on that. And Wendy really unloads about how bad the situation is, and then Stephanie's like, have some coffee. I would love if there was an outtake or something where as soon as she drinks some coffee, turns into an like an ad for coffee or something. Like, you know, if you're feeling psychotic, just have a sip of this particular brand of coffee. You'll feel great. Your hair will grow back. Wow, that kid's a terrible actress. But, I mean, a, you know, kid actors are rarely good actors. I really appreciate that, you know, Wendy and Franny both seem completely normal right up until the moment they, you know, lose the rest of their hair. It makes it even scarier. I would definitely say that Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers are terrifying, especially Michael Myers, especially in the original 1978 movie, but that's, I'm not going to get off on, tangent, on a tangent here. You know, they don't talk in general. They're never normal, you know, as if there was such a thing, but 
the killers in this movie are, you know, they, they behave as everyone else right up until the moment they snap. You know, they, they have, like, headaches and, and, you know, start losing their hair and, and, you know, maybe lose their temper some. But they don't get completely, you know, yeah. Before they snap, it's not, yeah. I like the smash cut from the babysitter, from Wendy talking about the, about Ed's face to a partially defaced poster with his face on it. And Zippy is wearing the suit that, you know, from Dr. David's office. Anybody could tell from looking at you that you wouldn't kill anyone. A line very clearly written before the decision was made for Zippy to act so erratically. Honestly, I kind of feel like maybe that line should have been changed. Maybe just like anyone who knows you, anyone who really knows you would know that you wouldn't kill anyone. Because that I can believe. But the idea that you would know from looking at him that he's not, that's, that's a really, yeah. I'm not saying Jeff Lieberman is like perfect. And he's definitely an acquired taste. And Zippy uses the newspaper about John the Cop. Is it supposed to be like an intentional joke? That the, I mean, the, the one, it's just the headline and it has like, it like lists all the victims and, and specifies it. Like, honestly, in real life that, you know, the, the headline would be something like Cop Snaps Kills. Or something like that you know it wouldn't be cop snaps kills wife neighbor dog you know it's just it's it's really silly but yeah the dog's jaws were broken all the way back yikes and you know the the actress like he looked just like this please trust me on this we couldn't get an effects person to do it I realize not everyone agrees, but I do think it is legitimately very effective seeing the crime scene and hearing an audio flashback to it happening as the cameras show where the bodies were and the blood that hasn't been cleaned up yet. And Zippy even imagines choking John. And yeah, the parrot says blue sunshine and Zippy uses that in the further investigation. And I like the, you know, when Zippy goes to the, to, to Franny's place or workplace or whatever it is and sees all the, the photos, you know, it fades from the psychedelic looking photo of, of Ed Fleming's face with the words Blue Sunshine written under to one of the campaign posters. Just, you know, as Zippy gets there to question them about Blue Sunshine. It's also, it's a nice little sort of, he used to be Mr. Blue Sunshine, but now he's, you know, the the Mr. Government instead, you know. The very first thing that we see and hear, the actual Ed Fleming, you know, ra rather than people talking about him or campaign posters and such, is him shouting on the phone at someone working on the campaign for there not being enough people. It doesn't look good enough for him. Franny's gone. He's dead, Ed. And Wayne immediately falls for Alicia and introduces himself to her and we're told that he went to Stanford with Ed and he's known him for 10 years, so, you know, which becomes very important once you realize about the, more about the drug. Did you ever hear of the words blue sunshine and immediately the phony politician smile goes away and he claims to have never heard it, but he's clearly lying. And isn't that the tagline to have you ever heard the word of the words blue sunshine, which is it's it's a great like that is such a, a creepy. Yeah. And Zippy manages to get away from the cop because his car can make it up that hill, which the cops can't. I 
I think I saw someone saying that it wasn't a very exciting car chase or it was too short or something. I mean, yeah. I, I It's not like the draw of the movie, you know, but they they needed something there. They're, you know, as others have pointed out, Zippy isn't really doing very much to hide. Like, if he was really wanted for multiple homicides and they think that he's out there, he's really dangerous, he's not going to be able to move so freely and, no, you know, no one just, yeah. And Alicia tells Zippy about how Stanford is the common link between all of them. He thinks about Dr. David and can't help but look at a bald person near them. It's it's a it's a note the movie doesn't overplay, it doesn't go there like crazy often, but I do quite like that there are you know, there are Are there more than two? There's there are a few people in this movie that you see briefly that are not blue sunshiners but they are bald the 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 thing that like hypothetically any bald person you see could be a blue sunshiner but there's no indication you know by the time you've watched the entire movie it seems like the the people the couple of people you saw that were bald that you you aren't yet sure are blue sunshiners probably aren't because the movie would bring it up you know if they're there at the end like like if if he was you know when he goes to see alicia you know he doesn't say like by the way you got to tell the cops you know the the other actually yeah and, and one of them i think she saw one of them there in the in the park on the bench so you know no the the clearly they simply weren't but you might think that they are for some of the movie, and that's the that's the kind of paranoia that the movie wants to instill. And again, that the movie is satirizing with the the kind of you know the the messaging around drugs. Doctor David puts the cancer patient under, and she's visibly afraid. And like the music clearly suggests, something is going to go horribly wrong. Where is he? You're not thinking of going in there, are you? Do you really think that Zipkin looks even remotely credible, rational? Why would you believe a word he says? It, it, I mean, it's a wonder that Al Alicia does. It's the alopecia, Alicia. The surgery really is one of the scary scenes in the movie. It's already such a vulnerable position to be in, to be operated on, and the idea that the person performing the surgery might at any moment snap and start kill like it's it's just horrifying just the the idea that you know because we i mean franny franny didn't need someone to be sedated before he started doing you know so like hypothetically if you know like like the doctor is literally standing there have you know op the 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 open thing like just, like, imagine if he snaps and he, like, you know, rams his arm in, in the in the open surgery. Just, you know, just, yeah, just, just really, really horrifying. It's, I, I really feel like Jeff Lieberman, he has a knack for coming up with these situations. You know, there's no, there's no spaceship, there's no wizard. It's something that you can imagine without like a crazy leap of faith or something i'm not saying movies with spaceships and wizards are bad but just it's it's in the real world it's in the, the you know you can imagine it and they're legitimately horrifying it's it's such a scary like surgery is already really scary but yeah now let's see Zippy watches David, only walking out, you know, once he's, you know, to show that he's even there, once he can see that David still has his hair, at which point he tries to yank it all off, you know, like a sane person would. And 
which David talks about some favors that he owed Ed. You needed to know someone back then to score, and I knew Ed. And yeah, he tells Zippy he didn't take Blue Sunshine, he only ever sold it. He never touched acid since there was no quality control. Are, could, could there be some sort of time, you know, delayed effect like a time bomb? It could, but it's highly improbable. I guess that's director Jeff Lieberman telling the audience that it is a ridiculous concept and that it's on purpose because it's, yeah. This isn't Stanford. I can't just prescribe you anything I want. And Ed Fleming talks about how the problem is trust, trust in ourselves, trust in our government. Hi. No, not right now. And Alicia realizes Wayne has headaches and sensitivity to loud noises. And agrees to meet Wayne at the discotheque, realizing that he probably is a blue sunshiner and he's going to snap. And if she makes sure he's at the discotheque, that, you know, that's somewhere that the police can apprehend him. And I do also really appreciate, you know, the, the cop does try and it doesn't work out. So it does show that you really do need, you know, because a cop is going to walk up. He, he's not going to expect the guy to be inhumanly strong. So this is a situation where it is necessary. Like, hypothetically, let's imagine that Zippy turned himself in immediately and they keep him locked up for questioning well wendy almost definitely ends up killing those kids with without zippy there to stop her you know i guess wayne might not have been at the discotheque if not if alicia hadn't agreed to meet him there but he you know who, yeah who's gonna stop him from killing you know certainly ed trusts him with his life so you know, and yeah, the baby sister, baby, sorry, babysitter insists that she's okay with babysitting. And Zippy and the audience try desperately to see, you know, with our eyes, if the babysitter is losing her hair. Very effective and intense as Wendy's headache intensifies as the kids shout that they want. You know, let's see. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. Let's see. Ice cream, hot dogs, and Dr. Pepper. I mean, hot dogs and... Yeah, I'm not sure all three of those go together at these this at the same time for... A great anyway and you know the soundtrack builds to really hammer home heh, the headache and she stuffs aspirin in her mouth her eyes get really intense and she pulls off the wig and yeah and Wendy looks at the knife and it cuts to zippy and we worry what is gonna happen either off screen or when it cuts back to Wendy's And Wendy is about to stab at the kids and starts chasing them around the apartment. Extremely intense struggle between Zippy and Wendy. And it is simultaneously terrifying and exhilarating, a release of tension when he manages to launch her off the balcony. You know, it's actually the... Her... You know, she shows up several times in the, maybe I'll show these when the video is done, but unfortunately, when I hold something into frame, sometimes it messes up the autofocus, and it doesn't know how to fix, so, yeah. But she shows up several times in the DVD, both on the cover and inside, and, yeah. So, they, you know, they knew that that was one of the scariest images. Zippy is really good at incriminating himself, 
rushing up to the clearly distressed neighbor, Stephanie, putting his bloody hand over her mouth, shouting for her to stop screaming. And Wayne does a good job of coming up with a convincing story that doesn't incriminate Ed. And the junkie asks Zippy for drugs and then yells at the ball man who stares at them until he's scared him off. Would you get out of here? Zippy, I don't think he meant run like you're fleeing a crime scene. I, I quite like the relationship between Zippy and David. Like, the, you know, clearly David wants to help. You know, they're... One of the last things that David says to him, you know, he, he says, you're, you know, you're all over the news or something like that. You know, they, they say you killed, you know, Wendy. And Zippy's like, I didn't do that. And David's like, I know that. Do you think I'd be sticking my neck out for you like this if I didn't know that? You know, there is, excuse me. You know, clearly he does, There there is a lot of trust between them. Now you're talking. What was she doing before? Tap dancing? If you jerk, it won't work. Words to live by. I can see what people mean about the weird energy of the scene you know, where he buys the dirt. And once again, I'm joking. I, you know, masturbate away. I don't. It's... And Zippy goes through the instructions. And as he's pointing the gun at the target, a cop looks at him and Fortunately for Zippy, he isn't looking for him, and it's, again, you know, for a second you're like, oh crap, he's gonna get caught, but it's, he's, he's a cop in a, in a gun store, it's not, you know, it happens. Let's see. And Zippy is told where the campaign rally is. Some people bring up the puppet show in their reviews. I don't know, I, I, I don't really care. There's a Barbra Streisand puppet. There's a Frank Sinatra puppet. You know, I, I do like the, the quick flashback where Zippy is reminded of Franny from seeing the, the Frank Sinatra puppet. I guess I can kind of see what people mean when they say that the middle third of the movie is less compelling than the first and the final third. I'm just not sure I agree with them. I do find the you know, Zippy gradually piecing together the mystery to be quite, yeah, you know, it's just, it's, it's legitimately a, a really creepy setup. And it builds nicely to when the, you know, to when she snaps and gradually we, we piece together that Wayne is also, yeah. Alicia meets up with Wayne, who is very sweaty, talks about not feeling so good recently. And Zip prepares the gun, puts it in his coat. Alicia directs the cop to Wayne, who attacks when the wig comes off. And Wayne starts throwing people around like rag dolls. And I, I really appreciate, you know, Alicia... She locks herself in the sound booth with Wayne right outside. She, you know, yeah, it's it's scary and she's in some danger, but how is he going to get in there, though? That's really, you know, she's not some helpless victim. And really, the, you know, the, the three women there at the start, you know, I mean, yes, they end up getting killed, but this is a person that they used to trust. It's not, you know... This is not one of the horror movies where a woman goes off to investigate a strange noise in a place where she already knows a killer is lurking, you know. And she turns up the volume. I saw someone say, oh, we haven't been told that she has any training in that. I mean, all you gotta do is push the, the thing as far up as they go. It's, it's not a difficult concept. It's, it's not rocket surgery. I, I don't know why you would think that... Doesn't everybody know that you just... You, you push the thing up as far as it goes to increase the volume. It's, yeah. It's an amusing little concept how Wayne gets past the the humming middle-aged... You know, she, I, I think she's like... It's like a jewelry store or something. 
and like you know she drops his jewelry and you know gets down to, to pick it up and doesn't see him pass I guess part of the reason that I personally find the clim cl climax to be so satisfying is that all along it's really been about making sure to trace the problem back to its source which they have by the end you know it you know Ed Fleming was the one who, who made and distributed Blue Sunshine and he's alive by the end obviously he's going to be taken into custody Alicia and Zippy are both going to you know point to him David Dr. David is going to back them up you know he's, he's going to say yes I know he sold it because I bought from him you know so so all this stuff I'm uh, I guess is 10 years would he still would Dr. David be in trouble with the law for that I'm not entirely but it's not even it, it might not even be necessary to you know but but yeah that was one of the important things. The other important thing is to prove it to the police, both so that they can pursue it and so that Zippy is not going to be blamed for the murders, which, once Wayne has been subdued, they can run tests on him. I agree that they could easily have run tests on the dead bodies as well, but that wasn't how the movie wanted to handle that. You know, The climax makes sense as a way to close out the story, and the little bit of text there at the end, I personally find... It's just very chilling, not unsatisfying. Yeah. And I personally find it incredibly tense and suspenseful here at the end with Zippy trying to get close to Wayne, get a good angle on him without Wayne realizing where he is. You know, you've got Wayne, like, standing and, and like, looking around, and when he's got his back turned, Zippy, like, runs and slides in behind the, the you know, so he's there at the, the, the... Yeah, so he's lying there on the floor, and he's got the gun, he's slowly pointing it up, he's reciting the whole thing, and Wayne turns the corner and is there, and Zippy shoots, and just, yeah, you know. The way I see it, Wayne probably kind of, like, he, he had, like, a, like, he, he sensed that there was something moving there behind, because, because you, you know, if something moves near you, even if you don't see it directly, you can maybe kind of sense there was there was something there, you know. And instead of going around, or maybe he started by going around, and then he turned back around and went into the front, but just, yeah. And I really appreciate that this is not one of those end of the movie, you know, tense suspenseful scenes where someone has to fire a gun, and the guy who wants to stop them from firing the gun manages to smack it away, and then they fight, and then the guy has to run over and grab it and then shoot. It's just, he's he's able to, because I'll grant that those, a lot of those scenes are very tense and suspenseful, but boy, do they get hard to believe after a little while. Because, like, you know, once, once the gun gets knocked out of their hand, at that point, the other guy has one. You know, how how could you possibly actually get the you know so i appreciate that this movie doesn't do that and again it, you know maybe it's more of a you know that that's the kind of thing that you'd see in the 80s and 90s and probably still today i don't watch a lot of the current horror movies but maybe not as much in the 70s i i have not watched very many 70s horror movies now i guess maybe an argument could be made that the tension that tense and suspenseful portion could have, you know, maybe should have gone on for longer, but then we just had this, you know, big thing of Wayne, you know, throwing around people in the dis discotheque, you know, that, I mean, I didn't sit and count, but does he maybe, like, hit and throw maybe a dozen people or more, you know, that's, that's pretty significant, so we don't need, uh, yeah. And, you know, they're, they're at the end, you know, the, the ads say, Ed Fleming is the future. And, and I think that's, yeah, we hear several things. And I think Ed Fleming is the future is the part that kind of like echoes. And, you know, the TV ads all say that he should be in Congress when, again, 10 years earlier, they wanted to tear down the system, not work within it. And, yeah, once again, I'm sorry, but the text there at the end really sends a chill down my spine. The idea that 
what was it, 255 ticking time bombs out there still, just, yeah. So yeah, the movie is 89 minutes long without end credits, and 91 with them. So, so moving on to the second section, notes taken before watching. So basically, you know, this is where I usually try to get into the, the people who made the movie and the other stuff they've made and such. But for this, the only person I know... Oh, hold on. Just a second. Make sure. Oh, that's right. There, there are a few. But almost the only person who worked on this that I know any other work by is director Jeff Lieberman, who, you know, I... I I already reviewed The Ringer, although I guess that video isn't public yet. I'm, I might make it public soon. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I did already record it. And then in 1976, he made the movie Squirm. I've only watched the MST3K, but it's one of those MST, you know, one of the movies they did on MST3K where I could watch it without MST3K and enjoy it. I'm almost sure. And... Honestly, yeah, okay, so I'm just really quickly gonna, I'm very briefly going to spoil it. So I'm, I'm gonna lower my index finger again when I'm done spoiling it, so you can just skip ahead, mute and skip ahead. At the end, you know, in Squirm, some of the shots of masses of worms, especially the ones near the end of the movie, are legitimately very creepy and unsettling. And the entire last bit with the the house being flooded by worms and and you know the the guy who wanted to be with the the girl falling into the mass of worms and like the worms come out of the shower head and and just you know the door is open and the, they flood out i'm sorry that's legitimately incredibly creepy and just you know and very creepy haunting singing at the very start and at the very end of the movie. Okay, no more spoilers for Squirm in this video. But, yeah, so those were the movies he directed. He also wrote the, these three. And he also wrote The NeverEnding Story 3. So, yeah, that is a terrible movie. But other than that, you know, I... It's, sorry, those are the movies of his that I know... You know, he's, he's directed several others. Other than The NeverEnding Story 3, every single movie that he has worked on, you know, that he's either written or directed, looks at least somewhat interesting to me. I, you know, I definitely can't claim that about every director that I like or even love the, at least some of the work of, including the ones who only made just a few movies. You know, the, just, I, I haven't been able to find the other movies of his on DVD, because, yeah, I'd like to watch them, all of them. He really is very, very, yeah, you know, like, like I say, he's an acquired taste, but he, he does, you know, some of the things he does, he does incredibly well, but, yeah, so this is produced by the same guy, George Man Manass, who also produced Squirm and Breon James, who's also in The Fifth Element, Red Scorpion, and Blade Runner. And in this, he, he's, you know, he's imitating a bird, or thinks he's a bird, or something. And one of them says, oh, like Rodan, the monster, not the painter. Anyway, excuse me, I love the effective, simple, creepy score. I can understand why some people might find it frustrating that Jerry spends so much of the movie suspected of the murders that he actually tries to prevent. And, again, like, it is, it doesn't make sense that they don't do some, uh, you know, just do some tests on the, you know, if they, if they did tests on the, the different dead people, they would see that both Johnny the cop and Franny the photographer had some kind of, you know, you know the, there's the thing that, once they do tests on Wayne, they find chromosomal damage. Well, why didn't they find that when running tests on the, the bodies of Fran? And, you know, it, 
it doesn't really make sense. And I don't know if Jeff Lieberman didn't think about that, didn't think of that element, or if he thought of it but still felt that it would work or, you know. But I agree, that does make it very hard to, to believe. But I feel like once you get past that hurdle, the, the movie is not, the movie is relatively credible. And certainly as, you know, I, f I find it really works as an exaggeration of, or, or a, you know, mystery murder story that's based in part on the government propaganda about uh, drugs. You know, overall, I'd say it is fairly easy, you know, other than testing the dead bodies, it's fairly easy to see why Jerry would, you know, being suspected of being the, the, the killer. You know, the truckers saw Jerry throw Franny in front of a truck and, you know, and then he runs and shouts and it just, yeah. The, the, yeah, I mean, I don't know that I love that element, but if not for that element, think about how quickly the situation would be resolved if Jerry could simply call the cops and tell them where the next attack might be. You know, as scary as the, the Blue Sunshiners are once they snap, and, you know, we see them attack their victims, they'd be no match for armed policemen. And if, you know, Zippy could move completely freely, that would also take away some of the tension of the movie. You know, again, think about if he ended up getting caught by the cops before the end of the movie, the Blue Sunshiners might end up killing a lot of people. As it is, Jerry is able to save a lot of lives because he gets to where an attack is going on before all that many have been killed. And even manages to take out some of the killers. I, I will say that it's very convenient that he manages to get to Wendy right before the, you know, right before she attacks the neighbor kids. It does make sense that you know once he, I mean, does he when he shows up? Does he even? Yeah, he probably thinks it's possible that she could be one of them. You know, since she was with Ed and a lot of, like, you know, if, if he did drugs and she know, you know, he used to sell drugs. She, she was with him for a while. You know, either she, either he somehow managed to keep it hidden from her, which is possible. Sometimes that happens. Or at some point, maybe she did some of the drugs, you know, like, Either they keep it completely secret, or maybe they broke up when she realized or something, but it's it's a logical... I'm not saying it always happens, and, you know, I don't think you should... You know, someone isn't a criminal just because they're near criminals, but it is a logical place for Zippy Zippy's mind to zip to. And we as viewers have an easier time buying the concept because we see all this evidence. But imagine actually trying to convince the cops of this utterly bizarre idea. And once you know that the movie is actually partially satire, that's part of the point. Lieberman is basically saying that if you experienced one of these anti-drug PSAs happening in real life and tried to explain it, people would not believe you despite the fact that the people making the PSAs expected the people watching them to believe it. You know, it's, it's a, I, I love satire. It's one of the best of all the things we people have come up with in all the history of, satire is one of the best because he really, when, once you real you know, once, once it clicks in your head, once you realize that that's what's going on, it's, it's, it's basically perfect because he's taken the, the structure, you know, this is, we've seen movies similar to this. With, excuse me, with this kind of thing of like, you know, someone's running around trying to figure out what is, you know, what is this secret? It's, it's, this, it's this conspiracy plot kind of thing, you know, basically some people did something and now something awful is happening and one man has to come to, you know, has, has to get to the, the, get to the bottom of it 
and not all of these stories, it's not always the cops that are chasing them, but there's often someone threatening you. Know, I, I really don't think it would work anywhere near as well if he could just, like, imagine if he could just, like, if he, I need to stop starting that sentence and start finishing it. If he could just talk to the police and get them to help, you know, then it's really no longer all that, like, yeah. So the, the, yeah, it, it, you know, the, the, the structure is the same as all these other movies. And Jeff Lieberman is basically saying, imagine if this kind of thing happened, but it was the drug, anti, excuse me, anti-drug PSA kind of thing that happened. You know, imagine, you know, yeah, people would believe you. You know, almost no one actually believes that Zippy isn't, like, Alicia is basically the one, per Alicia and David are the two people. Among the people who believe him are Alicia and David. But that's pretty much it. Like, everybody else is like, yeah, you know, once they, because it is just such a, such a ridiculous thing, and yet we were expect you know, if, if I, I'm not sure I was ever shown an anti-drug PSA. I've been shown PSAs in school, but I'm not sure anyone's more about drugs. If they were, I've forgotten, which gives you an idea of just how little of a, I probably didn't find them very credible. And once again, I don't, I can't imagine ever doing drugs. It's just not, I, I just don't see it. So, you know, but once again, I have no problem with people who do drugs. But, yeah, you know, you're, you're asked, we're asked to swallow this, but, you know, and, and, and again, like, you know, I'm sure it made, like, I'm sure part of the idea is it makes cops' jobs a lot easier if kids believe these anti-drug PSAs. But if you tried to convince the cops that one of these anti-drug PSAs reflected reality, they wouldn't believe you, you know, so, so that's, it's such a great, like, just, yeah, I, I really love it. It's just, it's just too bad that he, that's the thing, satire, when you do it incredibly well, not everyone will be able to tell, you know, it might, there might be a lot of people who watch, who, who experience satire and take it seriously, like, I've seen, like, there are critics, back when Starship Troopers came out, there were critics criticizing the aspects of the movie that are satirical. I'm, I'm not saying that movie is, like, you know, beyond criticism or something. If there's something that makes sense to criticize about it, you criticize it, of course. But, like, you know, I, I saw someone say, oh, it's all these young Aryan types who, you know, are great at sports and then they become really incredible soldiers. And that's the point. That's exactly the point because that's how that kind of thing is sold. Just watch American, you know, war recruitment stuff. You know, it is all about how, you know, you want to be a hero, if you want to be strong, you go be in, you know, you join the military. You know, it, it's base, and and you know the the whole Aryan thing is is obviously from from Nazi propaganda and all this. Just it, you know, it's a movie made up of young pretty people being heroes. You know, and then oh by the way, literally everyone who has any like every single one of their teachers has some kind of physical injury, and once you actually take a step back and think. Because they were in the war. Oh, oh, that's, oh, no. They were hurt in the war. And, and you know, and they don't stop and think, maybe we should stop sending all these young people to war. You know, because I'm almost definitely going to eventually do a full video. I, I don't currently have a copy. And I know, I know, I will get one. I swear. But I really, really love Starship Troopers. I don't... It might have been like 10 years or more since the last time I watched it, and it's still so vivid in my memory because it's just, I love, love Paul Verhoeven. Absolutely love his work. Anyway, and other, I will be doing videos on the first RoboCop movie, among others.
let's see. And I recently rewatched Total Recall. It's the the good one, not the 2010 one, but Paul Verhoeven's. And man, it's just it's so good. Also, sometimes a bit of an acquired taste. His movies can get pretty weird, but just yeah. But but Total Recall is a, you know it's an adaptation of Philip K. Dick that loves Philip K. Dick. You know it it's. It's not the exact same thing as the, the short story. I don't think the short story itself, I don't know, maybe a Twilight Zone episode or something, but by itself it wouldn't make for that compelling of a feature-length movie. But, you know, they made a great movie out of it by also taking some elements from some of his other stories and really using the themes and ideas that he loved to, to explore in his story. You know, I feel like if Philip K. Dick rest in peace, had lived to see Total Recall, maybe at first he would have been like, that's nothing like, you changed so many things from my short story, and then, you know, once it, it lands and such, he'd be like, you actually fit a lot of different things from my writing into this movie, you know, well done. So just, anyway, the, the, yeah, I, I, to, to, excuse me, to get back to the subject, I really love Jeff, Jeff Lieberman, Jeff Lieberman's satire. I love this and I love The Ringer and yeah, the, the, I really hope to find some of his other movies on DVD. Let's see. Ultimately, the, the, you know, that, that first attack I mean, I think at first we're supposed to think that Franny is embarrassed at being re revealed to be bald, especially at such a young age. But the, you know, the fact that, like, I mean, he he leaves and everyone, pretty much everyone leaves. There's only the three women left there, and I'm not sure exactly how long, how much time passes. Maybe it is only minutes, I guess. Because the others leave almost immediately, but, you know, then he comes back and then he starts attacking. I guess the idea, like when we see Wendy, we see that they, the, the, the Blue Sunshiners start attacking. They can start attacking at least right after snapping. And I guess, I mean, ultimately, I guess the idea is that the, the, I guess the idea is supposed to be that once Blue Sunshine fully catches up with you, then all your hair comes off. Like, first, it at first it's slowly, like, clumps of your hair come out. But then once it completely gets there and you snap, then all your hair comes off. And then, you know, for, with Franny, it was that, you know, the, the, the hair came off as someone else pulled it off. Wendy pulls her own hair off. I think with Wayne, it's also someone else pulling his hair off. You know, so the the, but that again is like, I don't know if the the hair coming off was a specific thing. I haven't watched that many of the American ones. A specific thing from these anti-drug PSAs, but I've seen clips from anti-drug PSAs, and certainly it's not. <laughs> It's not ridiculous compared to what they would say in those. Like, I, I remember seeing one where it's someone who you who does acid and, like, let's see. It's that they do acid and they get this hot dog and they imagine that the hot dog is alive and, like, they take a bite out of it and the hot dog screams in pain and they feel horrible. They feel like they just you know, did something monstrous and said, I'm not saying that no one who's done acid has had a similar experience, but this anti-drug PSA tried to make it out like that's everyone's ex experience. And like I said, when I talked about The Ringer, Stephen Hofstetter, you know, he really nails it when he says, the problem is that we tell young people that all drugs are the same because then when they try one drug and don't you know if they try like a hit of marijuana and it doesn't 
to, to like completely destroy them, then they're like, okay, I guess drugs aren't that big of a deal because, you know, if you don't know any better, you might think that doing drugs is like eating a lot of sugar in a row. You know, it, it, you know, yeah, getting a lot of sugar in your system in a very short amount of time, and it's not. It it can be much more powerful and have some really negative effects, and you need to know about those. If you you know if if you tell kids that all drugs are the same, and they do a drug that's not a big deal, they might end up thinking no drugs are a big deal, and end up doing a really hard drug without being prepared for it. You know, so yeah, the the I'm not saying no one has had an experience like that on acid, but making it out like that's the only experience you can have on acid is just ridiculous. And it is just like, yeah, you know, they, they make these absurd claims. So, yeah, I mean, the idea that, like, you know, 10 years after you do it, your hair comes off and, you know, you snap and start killing people. I'm not sure that is more ridiculous than what is actually said. Stated as fact, let's remember, stated as fact in these anti-drug PSAs. You know, they, they're not presented as like, oh, you know, it's Halloween, so we got to scare you. You know, let's, let's, tell, let's tell some ghost stories and, and scare each other. And then, you know, when it, you know, tomorrow we, we realize that it was no big deal. It was just, it was dark and we told some spooky stories. No, they, they were telling kids that these things are real. So, yeah, this movie, it's, it's really too bad that so many people, and again, I used to be one of them. I used to think, ah, oh, I love the movie. It's, it's not very credible, but I do love the movie, you know, but no, it's, it's, it's such a great satire on it. It really, it's such a ridiculous idea. You do this drug, 10 years later, all your hair comes off. Just, like, almost all of it. Like, there, there are these tiny little tufts still but it's not it's not that there's just a little it's just like i mean in in reality they're like wearing bald caps or something you know and and you know your hair comes off and then you start going around killing people and you have inhuman strength and stuff that's if you tell teenagers that yeah uh, you know some of them might still some of them might not believe you but the ones that do believe you might get really horrified and never touch drugs you know which is what the the people making the anti-drug PSAs want, but when you actually just, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, and once again, you know, it is legitimately terrifying to imagine someone you've known for years might suddenly snap and start killing you and your friends. You know, killing, a, a person might snap and kill their own friends, their own, you know, and what an unbelievably brutal way to stage your opening kills of your horror movie. People being horribly burnt in a fireplace. And it happens so quickly that we, you know, we barely, just, yeah, we, we barely have time to register what's going to happen until we see the person in the fireplace on fire. You know, we, we can tell that, you know, the Blue Sunshine is about to do something, but we don't know exactly what until we see the person already on fire. And, you know, trying to crawl out, being shoved back in, that's just, yeah. And, and again, I really appreciate that image because, and I can imagine some of the, some of the, like, censored versions or some of this probably just go, you know, we see him throw and then we see a close-up of his face and then we don't see more until Jerry gets there or something. But, no, we see at, at least twice, maybe more than twice, Clearly, Franny, you know, we see the woman tr starting to crawl out of the fireplace and like her arm is on fire and Franny shoves her back in. And, you know, I'll just briefly, you know, to, to get the, the movie magic. When I lower my index finger, I'll stop destroying movie magic. But obviously in real life, no person got shoved into the actual fireplace. When we see a woman trying to crawl out, you know, it is only her arm on fire. There's no fire in, behind her. If you, if you look at the way the shot is framed, you can't see any fire 
other than the one on her arm. And that, you know, that's how they did it safely. Because as long as you put out that fire not too long, you know, yeah. No more breaking of the illusion. Now, let's see. Yeah, you know, the... Um, I think... Yeah, that, that... That was something I had already said, so there's no... Yes, so... The mystery works quite well. You really don't guess the twist of the acid until it's revealed. And... I've, you know, like I said, I read some, I read all the reviews I could find, you know, of this before doing this video on it, and a number of people say there's no mystery. That's because you were sold on the movie by being told the twist. You have to put yourself in the mind space of not knowing the twist, because if you go, you know, let's see, the trailer, I, I, I don't remember about the trailer, but if you imagine just watching it, not knowing what the words blue sunshine mean, and just sitting and watching it, not already knowing the twist, you really don't guess it until it's revealed. You know, but yeah, obviously a lot of people today, you know, they're told what the twist is, and then they're like, oh, I have to watch that movie. The movie isn't made for that. You know, when Jeff Lieberman made the movie, he didn't know that in the future, people would go back and watch, like, let's see, 1970, was he filming, like, 1976, I, I feel like I read that that was when he was filming it, was, like, VHS, and I guess, like, movies on TV. Maybe, but he really couldn't have guessed that the, you know, and I get why today the movie is sold like that, because that is something that, like, if you just hint at, oh, there's, there's a big mystery, you know, no, the, the thing that people are going to talk about when they talk about the movie is that people, you know, there were people who did a specific kind of acid, they, then, you know, later they, excuse me, they lose all their hair, and they start going around killing people. That's how you sell the movie, because that's the, the thing. Like, you know, uh, let me think. Is there a movie I can I can point out what the big selling point is without also spoiling? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's, you can't not spoil them. Anyway, there are a lot of movies that are sold on specific images or ideas or, you know, things where if you know it going in, it's, you know, like the, the movie wasn't made thinking that you would know that kind of thing going in. Because then it is less effective than, you know, but yeah, it, I, I really don't think it's right to judge the movie itself for the, the how the mystery unfolds because when it was made I would say most people probably didn't see coming what again I forget about the trailer if that maybe hints it too strongly at it but without that if you just sit down and watch the movie and you don't know I mean let's see the first time I watched it I probably let's see yeah I think I read the back of the cover, before, and that was how I realized I wanted to watch it. And this just straight up explains everything. Yeah, so, you know, the, the today, a lot of people, you know, don't, but it's like, let's see. Is that technically a spoiler? I get pretty much everything that I could use as an example would be a spoiler, and I really don't want to spoil any, but just 
you know, when you think back on the, a lot of movies, the, the thing that you, you know, if you told someone to watch it and then said the thing that you especially loved about the movie, a lot of the time that's going to be a spoiler. You know, the most notable thing about the movie, they're not going to just throw, you know, the, because it's more effective if you don't know. Like, hypothetically, if you watch a movie and you don't know anything about it going in, that's going to have the, you know, you're going to be more surprised by the things that happen in it then. But that's just not, you know, you, you really, when you review this movie today, you really have to respect that the way we, the, the way we hear about obscure movies today is completely different from the way the movie, you know, the movie wasn't even supposed to be obscure. Like, it, I forget what the thing, it was like the, the company that bought the movie accidentally misplaced the negative or they went bankrupt and so no one had the negative for a while. I don't remember, but it's just, it, a lot of people who have watched this movie knew what it was about going in, and that's not the movie, the, Jeff Lieberman did not make the movie n with the idea that you should know what's happening going in, because yeah, that I get that then you would think it takes too long to reveal what the audience already knows, but if you actually watch it, the audience doesn't know those things until quite a bit into the movie. Now, let's see. I haven't watched them, and it's not really relevant anyway, but I'm just going to acknowledge that, yes, apparently star Zolman King went on to direct softcore porn in the 90s. I saw at least one user review that said that it's underwhelming to see Jerry using a dart gun with tranquilizer at the end. I guess instead of a handgun or the like. Personally, I think that makes it much more tense and scary. A handgun would make things too easy. G quicker to reload, easier to threaten with, no matter where you hit him, you might stop the guy. And obviously the rationalization of the script is he's a wanted man, he's wanted, you know, if he goes and actually shoots. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, if he shoots this guy, it's going to make him look more guilty, even if it is in self-defense, because that's how he got, you know, each of these times it was in self-defense. But they also need someone alive who's, you know, who's on Blue Sunshine to test. Now, let's see. Yeah, just as a real quick, you know, to clarify, if he had a handgun... He could shoot him in, like, the foot, and it would be fine. But if he shot him in the foot with a trank dart, the trank dart's not going to go through the shoe, and he's not going to have time to reload before, you know, so he lost. That's it, you know. But yeah, I, I like it a lot better than if it was a handgun. I feel like we have enough horror movies where at the end, you know, one of them faces off against the threat and they have a useful weapon. I'm not saying it's wrong to make more, but I'm glad there's something where... You know, that we have some movies where it's something that's very difficult to use. I mean, again, I don't want to spoil, but I can think of a lot of horror movies that end with someone going up against the killer, and they have a weapon that's actually very useful. And maybe, oh, but the killer is stronger. Yeah, but they still have a crazy useful weapon. And here, it really isn't that useful. Like, it, you know, he's... If he pulls the trigger in the wrong way... It won't work, literally. If you jerk, it won't work. So it, I mean, it's a, it's a, maybe it's not a one in a million shot, you know, the, yeah, I think that's enough for you to get the reference, and if I say much more, I'm going to be spoiling a movie, so, which is a classic, and I love it, and I'm going to move on now. Let's see. Now, yes, others say that they find the ending very unsatisfying, just has the text there. You know, I find it very chilling. You don't know what's going to happen next, and, you know, the movie does have a sort of climax in the defeat of Wayne, so, you know, I, if, if there wasn't the defeat of Wayne thing, like, let's hypothetically say that when the cop goes in... Yeah, let's say that... You know, let's backtrack to the, the discotheque. Wayne goes into the bathroom. And, 
you know, the, the cop goes in and is about to apprehend him, and then Wayne starts going nuts, and he attacks the cop. The cop grabs his gun, shoots him dead. And then Alicia come, runs in and says, if you test him, you can see he has blue sunshine in the system. And, and then you, you know, th then you get the, the little text bit at the end, and then the credits are rolled. That would be unsatisfying. I think if you don't have the discotheque attack and zippy tranking Wayne, then I think it's unsatisfying. But I think that they did... I. I, th I really love when a horror movie ends and there's like, but it's still out there, though. That's that's one of the scariest things. And because of that, it's also something that some people really hate when a horror movie does that. And they're like, but I wanted the threat to be over when the movie ended. You know, I wanted for the end credits to roll right after the threat was dead. I think... I do think there are some great horror movies that end like, you know, but I do think some, one of the best ways to end a horror movie is to say that it's still out there, you know, and it's actually extremely difficult to provide a satisfying ending without finishing off the threat. And the moment that you finish off the threat permanently, it's like, well, I guess that was that, then it's not scary anymore, you know. Imagine watching this movie, seeing the text crawl, not knowing whether or not it's true, and then walking home afterwards. Just imagine walking home in the dark, looking around, trying to see if anyone's bald, trying to think about, do I know someone who went to Stanford? Could, could, is it possible they did drugs? Because when this movie came out, it actually had been, you know, it was 10 years since the the you know it, it when the movie came out you know the movie is set what's the phrase the movie is set when it came out so when it came out obviously it was more effective for the audience than you know what you know today watching it again it's like well 1966 that was a long time ago obviously if anyone was going to snap off blue sunshine it would have happened a long time ago but that's, you know, I, th I think a lot of movies are made specifically for the experience of watching it in the theater in an original theatrical run. And then, like, if the movie eventually ends up on TV or DVD or whatever, that's good, too. And for sure, some movies are made to, to go, you know, to, to last for a long time. You know, they, they set the events far into the future or something. But a lot of... A lot of the best horror movies take a snapshot of when they're made and they say today it might have or you know or very soon it might happen but yeah let's see most reviews that mention the hair laws appear to believe that the characters lose all their hair at once but I read at least one IMDb external review where the person seemed to believe that the characters had already lost all their hair was hiding it with a wig and that having the wig removed is such an embarrassing experience that that's what makes them snap you know the the embarrassment which is an interesting take i do think it's the former which as many reviewers point out is absurd it wouldn't come out all at once like that but then like i said i don't think that's a bad thing for the movie it works with the how ridiculous are anti-drug PSAs, am I right tone of the movie. You know, it is like it's it's an it's an absurd notion that like I mean it, basically the the idea must be that from one moment to another, basically, their hair just comes off. Just just like that and leaving you know, it's, it's, there, there isn't, like, a really thin, like, tiny little bit of, of hair left. No, 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 just, it's just gone. And, and then they snap. And several of them do snap specifically, like, actually, yeah, the, all three people that we see snap. We don't know about Johnny since no one survived that. And we didn't see it. You know, no one survived to, to, to tell us about it. And we didn't see it happen. But the three people we see snap, 
specifically, like Wendy removes her own hair, but the other two, someone else grabs the hair and removes, or, or, or yeah, the hair comes off, and as soon as the hair comes off, excuse me, that's when they're ready to, you know, excuse me, yeah, then the, they snap. That's that's them snapping the hair coming off like that, which, yeah, but I mean, the. the yeah, it's 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 as ridiculous of an idea as many of the ideas in these anti-drug PSAs. Excuse me. I've seen movies with way more gore than this that are nowhere near as scary as this movie. Jason X comes to mind, and I'm not going to get too much into that because I think I probably bring that movie up more than I should, but yeah. It's just not a very scary movie, that's all I'm going to say. The, the parts of Jason X that are kind of self-parody are not actually bad, and a couple of times it tries to be really nasty and gory and such, and that can be pretty good, but on the whole, it's really not that good of a movie, and it doesn't really seem to understand, at least some of the time, why people like Jason Voorhees. The, the sci-fi twist is very misjudged it really that is not what is like yeah that's a spoiler so I'm not I'm, I'm gonna move on from it it's legitimately terrifying to imagine someone you've known for years suddenly becoming a psycho killer it's a really compelling way to start the movie now Yeah, as so a real quick, again, imagine going into this blind. Imagine not knowing what it's about. And, you know, the opening credits and you see these three seemingly unrelated people, you know, oh, headaches and just, uh, you know, hair coming out. And, and, and then it goes to the party and you don't know what's going to, you don't know any of these people. And at, at first you don't even know that Zippy's the lead. You know, he's a face in the crowd. That's that's all. He's not introduced as a significant character. And suddenly, Franny, you know, the hair comes off. And then, you know, minutes later, he comes back and kills these three women. It's like, what? What is even going on here? Like, this is nothing that we've ever... Like, it's so... Like, again, like, the moment that you see one of these, like, I love slasher movies. I'm not trying to bang on slasher movies, but in a lot of slasher movies, and that is in part the point, the moment that you see the slasher killer, you know, oh, that that's dangerous. You know, that, that individual is definitely going to kill someone, and you should stay far away from them, and, you know, try not to break the unwritten rules they have, and all these things. But seeing someone start to attack their friends, it, it, that really is like just where, what is going on? You know, it's, and, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a very compelling way to start the movie. You, you really, you don't know what's going on and you don't, the, the, I, I would I would love to like if I could if I could like time travel and erase my memories I would love to like travel back and watch this in a crowded theater full of people who had no idea what was going on in 1978 not myself not knowing what's going to happen in the movie and just I mean it must be just a jaw dropping moment when you see like he's he's killing people and what. He's burning these women that he's been friends with for years. What is even happening? And that just, and the, as the mystery, you know, slowly unfolds, you know. And that really, if you want to enjoy the movie, you have to put yourself in the mindset of someone who doesn't know what's going to happen. And that's, I know that it's difficult. It's, diff, you know, it's difficult for anyone who tries that. 
but it's worth the effort. I just I find it frustrating to read people who complain that a movie they watched the wrong way didn't work for them. Just obviously, if you know the twist, it's not going to be as effective. You know, I realize that there are movies out there where you can know the big thing and it can still be very effective, but you can't complain that a movie that wasn't made, like if this movie was made today and they intentionally, and, and like the people making it said, you got to sell it by giving away the ending then I'd be like, oh, come on, that's that's a bad way to handle it, you know. But that's not what happened. It Once, we got to remember that after, you know, the, the movie was lost for several years, and then when it came back, it was like, well, we can't just tell people, remember when you watched this? And it's hard to sell a movie that's old. You know, it's hard to tell people, like... I love the movie The Godfather, but I've never been not aware of The Godfather. Like, I was probably nine when I first heard about The Godfather. You know, when I watched The Godfather, I was not nine when I watched The Godfather, but when I watched The Godfather, it had a history, you know. I, I didn't know everything that was going to happen in it, but I had heard people talk about, you know, I, I looked it up on IMDb and saw that it was... Let's see, The Godfather Part 1, I want to say, last I checked, I think it was like number 2 on the top 250 of IMDb, you know. So, one of the best movies ever made, even though it's like, what's the first one? 1972, I think, you know. Now, there are not a lot of 70s movies that people point to and say, this is one of the best movies ever made, you know. And, and, and IMDb, you know, it's based on user votes, so it's people voting today, it's people today saying this is one of the best movies ever made, you know. So when I sat and watched it, you know, I mean, it's not the fastest moving movie ever made. It's it's an incredible, I'm, don't, okay. Obviously the crafts, the craft of The Godfather 1 and 2 is infinitely superior to the craft of Blue Sunshine. I'm not just, you know, I'm not disputing that. What I'm saying is, that movie, I, I can imagine if you try to sit down and watch that movie today and you don't have all the history, if you haven't been told for years that it's one of the best movies, I, obviously that can also make, make it a letdown for you, but if you watch a movie that you know nothing about and it starts off kind of slow and you, you know, and, and another thing, you know, one thing that The Godfather also you know, you watch the movie and it's like, oh, wow, Al Pacino. Oh, I've watched him in like 20 movies that came out since this one. Oh, he's great. Oh, it's, it's so good to see such an early role for him. You know, that, that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's just, it's not. Blue Sunshine doesn't have those kinds of benefits and they had to sell it and it's, you know, the the thing that if you could only if you had to elevator pitch someone on watching Blue Sunshine, yeah, you'd probably say they did acid, then their hair comes out, and then they start killing people. But if you say that to someone, which is obviously what happened with a lot of people, then they're gonna watch the movie and it's gonna be like, I mean, nothing about it surprised me because I knew everything about the mystery going in. You know, it's just you can't judge the movie harshly by the the marketing that happened since the you know it just it's, I, I I find it really frustrating when people criticize something don't judge the movie for the fact that the movie was lost for some years and the only I mean how do you sell this movie when like it's you know there are a couple of names connected to it that are really you know that that you could point to and say oh you know it's got it's got Breon James for example you know but it's not like like comparatively let's say that uh, let's see if if hypothetically a you know let's see yeah, let's let's for example say that like today 
someone came out and was like, I found these deleted scenes from The Godfather, and they completely changed the story. People would go nuts about trying to watch them, you know. But this, like, is a... Well, I mean, the director isn't that popular. Like, he's, you know, he's made several movies that people love, but he's not, like... You know, it's it's he's not... You know, he's not like John Carpenter or Wes Craven or someone who for years, for decades, had a name as being an incredibly, you know, I mean, he hasn't even, Jeff Lieberman hasn't even made all that many movies, you know, period. And, you know, some of his movies are very weird and not very mainstream, not very audience, not, not very let's see, crowd-pleasing kind of movies. So yeah, they sell the movie by giving away the mystery. Now, let's see. So, so yeah, to return to my notes, you know, seeing Franny suddenly kill his friends is a really compelling way to start the movie. You may not be able to empathize with a lot of the things, you know, there are a lot of things that Jerry does that are difficult to empathize with, but it's easy to imagine wanting to figure out why someone you knew suddenly went crazy. Now, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yet, if you hadn't watched the movie and you read some of these reviews, some of them don't mention the fact that Franny runs off and then later returns, and it's only when he returns that the killing starts. You know, the, the, let's see. And depending on which review you read, the people who leave the party after the guy, after Franny loses his wig are going home, going to look for him, or a third option that I, I'm afraid I didn't write down and later forgot. And there are also very different opinions on why, you know, the other guy pulls at Franny's hair and if he should or shouldn't have done it. I think it does make a lot. I mean, the, the Franny's about to kiss the other guy's girlfriend. So it's, I mean, and I mean, it's maybe kind of weird to pull at the hair instead of like, you know, just like hypothetically, if I was in that situation you know if this if this is Franny's head and this is my hand I probably do like this you know just you know just okay that's that's enough you know I, I wouldn't yank at the hair but they you know they needed a big sort of dramatic you know that's that's the thing you don't ex you don't see it coming you really don't think that the hair is just gonna come off and so because it would be one thing if it was, like, let's hypothetically say that Rodan guy suddenly got up and attacked people. It'd be like, well, yeah, he was clearly, there was something going on there. You know, he, he seems to think he's a bird. He keeps pretending to be a bird after, you know, just, anyway. If someone got out of the crowd and started killing people, it wouldn't have been as effective. But literally, like, Franny comes down and is like, ah, let's get a group shot of everyone before I start killing people. That's not what he would say, obviously, but, and then he's like, and, and then some of them are like, ah, come on, do some, you know, do some Sinatra for us. And he's like, yeah, sure, what the hell, you know, and, and he starts, you know, and he's like, oh, let's dim the lights and this whole thing, you know. And just, and from one second to another, he snaps at the, at the hair being pulled, you know, so it is this thing of just, what even just happened it comes completely out of nowhere it's not it's not something that it really builds up to it comes out of nowhere and that makes it all the more effective now i i like how the movie mentions several times how strong the formal quarterback is he keeps bragging about it in the movie climax is him snapping and jerry having these you know 
yeah, I mean, to fight him so we know now just how dangerous he is. You know, even, you know, we already knew that you become even stronger when the, the you know, when, when you snap, if you're a blue sunshiner. But that makes it even more scary, so, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I didn't really make any notes about the trailer. I just noted that it goes over the people, excuse me, who took Blue Sunshine. But, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I simply don't remember it. The, let's see. Yeah, I didn't really have a lot to say about the various YouTube videos on it. Let's see. I used it as an excuse to rewatch the MST3K of Squirm, which is, you know, amazing. It's one of the best. But they have a lot of really great ones. Right. The There's this guy who calls himself the Lucid Nightmare. I actually, I, when I saw that, I thought that the Lucid Nightmare was referring to, you know, Blue Sunshine. But apparently that's just what he calls his videos. But, you know, he, he really loved the video. He loved the movie. It's a really good review. And I sub subscribed to him because of watching his review of this movie. That's how good it was. Now, I listened through the commentary track. Now, so let's see. The, it features... Yeah, it's a director's commentary track. I remember back when... You didn't even have to, it, it just, there's a commentary track. Oh, the director made a commentary track. And, it, you know, today it's like, oh, you know, it's got, you know, these, it's got this person and this person, but not the direct, you know, no, this is, it's Jeff Lieberman and there's another person on there, but he doesn't identify himself. So I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know who it is. I think I saw in a review, someone said that, you know, who it was, but I didn't note that here. So sorry. But yeah, the commentary track is worth listening through. He says that, you know, the women killed by Franny are stunt women, and he admits their acting is only passable. And, it, you know, it is the, it's an independent movie. It's the kind of thing where a big-budget movie would have actresses there and then have the stunt women wear, you know, say, the same clothing, but it's independent. So, yeah, he just he hired stunt women, and, yeah, their acting isn't particularly good because they're not usually speaking lines on camera. They're... You know, they're, you know, some performers are incredibly talented, but their talent more, you know, typically calls for a sort of physical performance more than them delivering lines and such. And he calls the, the doctor's lost hair a red herring, a brown hair herring. And he liked the movie Manhunter better than Sounds of the Lambs. And they meant for the bodyguards, for Wayne's hair to be obviously a wig. And part of the hair losing thing is the Lieberman had, I think he said it was scarlet fever, but um, yeah, yeah. As a kid, and was told he might lose all his hair for life. He made that fear the viewer's fear. You know, a, a lot of movie, a lot of horror movies, they have the fears that, you know, Wes Craven was once bullied by a kid named Fred Krueger, so he wanted to make the world fear Fred Krueger. Which is just the perfect way to get back at a bully, you know. The, the... Anyway. Yeah, so, and actually I think he, did he maybe even mention that name more than one of his characters, Fred Krueger, I forget. But, but yeah, you know, so, that's, that's part of the hair loss, and that's, you know, yeah, you know, when that Scarlet Fever or whatever it's called, yeah, that actually does, I, I think, it does actually lead to, you know, hair loss or something. So there it is somewhat more credible. But yeah, that's, yeah. Let's see. And he realizes how silly the monologue about how to use the darkened sounds, though he wrote it himself. And yeah, it was, you know, he, he wrote it planning to have Zippy restated near the end to focus. I really love that. I, th I think it works really well to, to give him that bit to, to repeat. To Yeah. And he said he wasn't careful enough when dealing with Wendy having some hair pulled out 
admits that he should have used a wig, not pull it from between her real hairs. I, I forget what he says. He says something like, "Nobody told me, you know, not to not to do this." Yeah. And he realizes not everybody finds it scary, considering that Zippy finds the cop and his family already dead by the time we get there. Let's see. Yeah, the, you know, the cops are already dead by the time they get there. I think he then says, with Wendy, it ends really quickly. But he does like the idea that it could turn out, you know, anyone could turn out to be a Blue Sunshiner. And the name Blue Sunshine is made by combining the names of different drug strands. And, yeah, and, and he put, you know, he, he wrote this thing on... You know, in, inside the DVD cover, there's this paper that you can take out. And he wrote, you know, it took, took six to eight minutes to read throughout. And he points out long hair, you know, and, and having a lot of hair was important to hippies. It was about identity and independence. So, wait, sorry, he didn't write it. Someone wrote it. One second. Yeah, sorry. That's it. He wrote the opening quote, and the rest of it is written by someone who worked for the, the company putting out the DVD. Sorry, that was, that was how it was. But yeah, when Jeffrey Lieberman removes the hair from these hippies, he's destroying who they are. I hadn't thought of that, but that is very clever. And, let's see, yeah, and the guy writing that, the, the, you know, believes that it's not that they lose all the hair at once, it's that they're wearing wigs that are being pulled off. You know, intentionally wearing wigs. And, let's see. Yeah, the DVD also comes with a 30-minute interview, Lieberman on Lieberman, which, you know, it's good, it's worth watching. And two slideshows, one that's behind the scenes, one that's I want to say movie stills, but I forget. And I, yeah, I have nothing to add. I'm, I'm glad I own the DVD rather than just having access to a copy without having the DVD. Now, that brings us to the final section. I, sorry. Critics, IMDb, and Wikipedia. So, let's see. There. There we go. And, yeah, so this, I'm, I'm going to quote some reviews, excuse me, from Rotten Tomatoes. And these are, I'm starting with reviews from professional critics. There we go. Blue Sunshine poses anxious questions about a late 70s America whose middle-aging middle class is made up, inevitably, of casualties from the previous decade when the current establishment was, was first establishing itself. Now, let's see. Yeah, okay, so this person didn't didn't love it. The melodramatics never get better than intriguing. Like I said, acquired taste. And this one person says, seems to have been made to give former hippies the willies. Now, let's see. Okay, so moving on to user reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Refreshingly distinctive from beginning to end, Blue Sunshine's unsettling minimalist score and extremely disturbing bursts of madness and violence are anchored by convincing performances within a relatively believable story. A unique gem, to be sure. Oh, right, sorry. Dawn of the Dead. The original Dawn of the Dead I have, of course, watched. I have, I'm have. i not completely unfamiliar with 70s horror. I have not yet... I'm not 100% certain if I'm going to do videos on George Romero's Trilogy of the Dead. The, the first three, you know, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and Day of the Dead, but I do love those movies. 
Maybe, maybe I will. Yeah, this is this is one one person just wrote jokes are bad. Okay, and let's see. Yeah. Let's see. Right, and yeah, so the IMDB stuff. The three taglines. Did you ever hear the words blue sunshine? Try to remember it. Your life may depend on it. That's such a great tag because like Again, imagine, the year's 1978, you see a movie poster, Blue Sunshine, huh, and you, you know, read the tagline, and it says, you know, try to remember your life may depend on, just, holy crap, you know, just, that, that tagline would have gotten me to watch this movie, if the, yeah, and, 1967, Doctors and Scientists Brigade. 1977, the nightmare has begun. And the third tagline is, it's a killer. Now, let's see. And yeah, so this is MDB trivia. In DVD commentary, Jeff Lieberman said that the full moon shot with credits of the film Playover was an intentional foreshadowing of the bald headed. And I'm not going to use that word. And Stephanie's two children in the film had to be dubbed by Lieberman's three year old daughter. The reason for this was the parents of both the child actors pulled them from the shoot after seeing the potentially disturbing attack scene being shot. Unfortunately, the two children were taken before they could be looped for the audio. And it really is, like... You didn't see that coming? That's... that's... yeah. I wouldn't want my child... and, and like... and Lieberman even, like, casually admits on the commentary track that when the... like... The, the parents knew that there was going to be a scene in which the kids were going to be attacked by, you know, one of the actors like that. But he said, I, I, I forget if he brought it up or they did, but, you know, he got communicated to them that he was going to shoot around it so that the kids would never be in the same frame as the knife, for example. You know, full, like... Uh, I guess, is that technically a spoiler? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess that's technically a spoiler. But there are horror movies that do that kind of thing. And Lieberman basically says on the commentary track he didn't, he had no intention of doing that. So, yeah, when they realized that he wasn't doing that and, and saw it, they go, yeah. I, why didn't you think about that? I, I don't, I'm not sure they could have done the looping. I think it might... In the 70s, I think it might be that back then you could only do the looping after, you know, yeah, you maybe like had to have the footage that you were going to loop for, and they're like watching the footage and looping as, the, I, I forget, I, you know, today you could, today you sometimes do ADR lines before you see the footage that it goes with, but I, I don't know how common it is, I don't know enough about how movies are made today, but I, d I don't know how he didn't see... The, I, I mean, if I was in his situation, I would have been like, they're going to pull the kids immediately, so I got to get my you know, my own kid to, to do the dubbing or something, but yeah. And that doesn't exactly help the, the performance, because the... And I saw someone point out, you know, there's a shot where Wendy's got the knife, and the, the I think it's the girl who's in front of her, and she's, like, visibly smiling, and it's like... Yeah, it might have been good to to maybe get another angle on that. Maybe like maybe shoot it from behind and from below. So you've got like the 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 kid's head here and then the knife, you know, up here threatening him. Instead of sure, but working with kid actors is hard. 
According to Jeff Lieberman, the New York Post did an article on Blue Sunshine, but apparently got its facts mixed up. The film ends with a statement that suggests the film is based on true events, but in actuality, it's, it's entirely fictitious. However, there was confusion when writing the article because it stated that Blue Sunshine was a real LSD epidemic and the film was based upon it. This is, of course, untrue. I don't know if... Is that one of those things with, like, all publicity is good publicity? Imagine reading that it's about a real thing. Oh, man, that must have read as incredibly tasteless. If you... Yeah. Now, let's see. Director Lieberman stated that upon the film's completion, two major TV networks expressed interest in purchasing the film as a movie of the week, an idea that initially seemed highly appealing, as the amount being offered was twice of the film's budget. However, after seeing the list of edits required and realizing that agreeing to them would result in a film only an hour long, Lieberman decided to hold out for a theatrical release. It really is. Like, wow. I, ca I can... Yeah, there's a lot to cut from this if you want it to be, like... I, I don't know enough about Movie of the Week, but, yeah, they pro it It's not... The movie is has a lot of things that are not appealing to a lot of people, and yeah, but I I could see that I could see how a third of the movie or more would and yeah. Now let's see. I guess that is technically a spoiler. Yeah. This could be regarded as a neo-film noir, being that it involves the wrong man plot. This falsely accused main character investigates various locations and characters to clear his name while learning the truth. Yeah. And it's also like, I, I'm going to try not to butcher the pronunciation. Giallo? The, the Italian, you know, mystery thriller and later horror genre with, you know, wrong man accused kind of thing. Jeff Lieberman originally planned on having certain scenes as flashback to the 60s, but decided it would be too costly. And I've seen people say that it should have that, you know, that it would be obvious to, and yeah, I think it, it would be a good thing for it to, you know, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what they would entail, but whatever they would entail, you'd have to make it convincing that what we're seeing was stuff that existed in the 60s, and a lot of stuff that you'd use normally in 1978, or sorry, 1976 when it was filmed, were not made in the 1960s, because a lot of, like, yeah, so. In the commentary, director Jeff Lieberman said he directed Zolman King to act strange throughout the movie so that viewers might think he could be the next killer. He said he wished he hadn't given him that direction, especially since King's character didn't graduate from Stanford like the other killers. So, yeah. You know, Lieberman himself admits that there are things, you know, because that's a, that's a big thing. Throughout the movie, Zolman King acts strange, and yeah, it really is, because, you know, once you get... There's, there's no, it makes no sense for, for the, the, the idea that he would be a blue sunshiner makes no sense. You know, he, yeah. Right, and the only goof listed is that the voice dubbing for Stephanie's kids often doesn't match the footage, which I noticed as well. I'm sorry, I just, there aren't a lot of quotes on the, on the IMDb memorable quotes page, which is too bad because I think the movie does have a lot of memorable quotes. Some for, you know, some intentionally memorable, some not intentionally memorable. I don't think Lieberman meant for the following to be such a memorable, but yeah. Stephanie, something's wrong with me and I don't know what it is. I've been having these awful nightmares, these headaches, the hair, it's driving me up the wall. Have some coffee. That is, I mean, one step at a time, I guess. 
It's just, but no, the the it it does kind of sound like, does she actually think that that's gonna solve it? Like it's just, it's, yeah. But let's see. Right, so this is, let's see, I think this is an, one of the, one of the reviews that are not, I gotta stop calling them external reviews, because that only makes sense if the person watching the video already knows that I'm talking about, that I got to them from IMDb. These are reviews that are not from IMDb and not from Metacritic or Rotten Tomatoes. There we go. You know you're entering Lieberman's world when the very movie title is spoken by his parrot. And I imagine that Lieberman had a checklist for this 70 style movie. Things that were popular at the time. For example, random car chase? Check. Discotheque? Check. Conspiracy theory? Check. Obligatory this movie is based on true events disclaimer at the end of the film? Check. Yeah, and the one reviewer said it the movie is an unjustly neglected genre classic that delivers a deft fusion of horror movie tropes, social satire, and cult film weirdness. See, I th I think this is a pretty decent. Yeah, there there are some there are some good points here, like its leading character. Sunshine can never figure out where it wants to go or how its hero can help. It's not like Zalman's got a bag of Zor Thorazine with him. Though fascinated by the power of LSD, the film lacks the... Uh, oh, yeah. Lacks the nerve to take two tabs and go off the deep end like everyone else, i.e. to visualize the hallucinations, so it mopes this on the sidelines and misses the party. And it's the same party at which Hitchcockophiliac Hitch de Palma STD clinician Cronenberg, downtown paranoia Cohen, and blue collar Swift Romero lost their minds, becoming lifetime master alterers. And yeah, I think there's definitely some truth there. Let's see. Now. Apologies for the dead air. I am going through notes to make to find something small. Yeah, this is a really great point. Made for $550,000, Lieberman created a fantastic hippie nightmare. In the United States, the 1960s started with fantastic enthusiasm and optimism. However, by the end of the decade, the country's hopes were in ruins. The assassinations of MLK, Malcolm X, and RFK, along with the Manson family massacres and the death at Al deaths at Altamont, had dashed any sense of optimism for the left. Likewise, Watergate threw a wrench into the right's belief that you can always trust authority. By the late 1970s, there were no institutions that could be relied on. That's a really good point, and that is, yeah, and let's see, yeah, and and Blue Sunshine comes directly out of that aimless malaise of the late seventies. There is a hopeless absurdity to the madness, but the film seems to seek for meaning in all of it. Let's 
Let's see. But in many ways, the movie Blue Sunshine is simply a product of its time. In America, the 60s saw an explosion of youthful idealism, but the advent of events such as the Vietnam War and Watergate soon saw an end to that. As the 60s counterculture dissolved back into the capitalist reality of the 70s, there must have been a sense of failure amongst the flower power generation. That concept is strongly implied here. Ultimately, Blue Sunshine feels like an analogy for the problems a society encounters when it faces the consequences of its own actions. And that's the thing, you know, the, the, like on the surface, you might say that the, these people's problems with acid come, you know, that they're facing the consequences of that. But, you know, yeah, the, 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 yeah, what he said, analogy. Now, let's see. Okay, so this is a pretty decent... Okay, yeah. Jeff Lieberman sometimes feels like a poor man's Larry Cohen, a quirky, independent filmmaker with big ideas whose films are never quite as focused as they should be. After the Revenge of Nature thriller Squirm, he made this wild and crazy lament for the lost idealism of the late 1960s, which, like a lot of his work, is full of great ideas, but a bit too scattershot to really be effective. Once again, I love the movie, but I think that, that, that does make a lot of sense, yeah. Now. Nah. Blue Sunshine feels the, like the despairing sorry, look over the shoulder of a 60s counterculture would be revolutionary, dismayed at the way things turned out. A decade on, the idealistic long hairs of the summer of love have become suburban divorcees, doctors, cops, and worst of all, politicians. The film is like the celluloid embodiment of the bad trip that was the 1970s after the 60s dream died at... I'm sorry, I forget how to pronounce this. CLO Drive, Altamont, and Kent State. Nothing affected me more than when the Beatles broke up, laments one character. My divorce was nothing compared to that. It's a film as crazy as its characters and plays a bit like the world work, sorry, work of David Cronenberg's not quite so organized, less intellectually rigorous, but even wilder younger brother. Whatever else you think of it, it's certainly unique. And As a horror film, there isn't much aggressive shock material on display. The unease of Blue Sunshine lies instead in its queasy sense of the mind and body breaking down without any control, all accompanied by a nerve-jangling score that sounds exactly like a musical nervous breakdown. That's, an, that's exactly, yes, well put. Now. And 
yeah, I made a lot of notes, stuff I wanted to mention, and I have been recording for entirely too long to get into all of it, so I am just... The biggest irritation factor comes from, from, comes from Zippy, who's not the brightest of heroes. He spends most of the movie trying to convince everyone that he's not the killer, but he's so stupid that he often will leave the scene of a murder screaming at the top of his lungs while covered in blood and holding a knife. Not the best way to prove your innocence. The film has a great title sequence where the potential psychopaths slowly start to feel the after-effects of the acid kicking in. Yeah, and there are only 54 IMDb reviews for this movie. And I copied in and read all of them. That is way too little. This movie deserves way more exposure. I mean, I realize that obviously more than 54 people watched this movie, but only 54 people felt the urge to write a IMDb review for it. And that is that is entirely too little. Now, and, yeah, so I'm almost all the way through them now. Yeah, see, the, the, again, I'm not judging this person for it, but this is, this is how a lot of people read the, the, the you know, if you don't realize it's satire, this is what it looks like. The attempt to tack an anti-drug message onto this piece is mainly symptomatic of the anti-drug hysteria that would characterize the Reagan era. Yeah, various reviewers say that it has Cronenberg vibes, which is very true. I will say, I haven't watched, I'm more familiar with his 80s work than his 70s work, but I, let me think, was Scanner 70s? I think I've watched at least one of his movies that came out in the 70s, but when I think Cronenberg, the, the movies I've watched the most are the ones from the 80s. Yeah, and this, let's see, so this person points out, the story isn't flowing well because the pacing is a bit off at times, and the movie doesn't really succeed in building up its tension properly. There's a nice amount of paranoia in the movie, since whenever someone is losing their hair or wearing a wig, who is bald shows up, they could be dangerous. Let's see. Yeah, this, this person does go on to say, but ultimately the problem isn't as widespread as I thought it was going to be. And I, I will say, it could have been super interesting. I... Maybe it's one of his, um, you know, maybe it's, it's possible that he did something in one of his other movies that, you know, but I would, 
I would like to see a version of this movie where it actually is widespread and just, you know, like by the end of the movie, you've seen many, many different people. You know, I mean, at the end of the, by the end of this movie, we only really have three, oh, sorry, four. There's Franny, the cop, Wendy, and Wayne. Those are the only four people that we met that we know for sure took Blue Sunshine. Is it ever, do we ever know for sure if Ed took Blue Sunshine? I forget. We know David didn't. David was selling it, and Ed was selling it. I'm not entirely sure if Ed was taking it also. But my favorite sequence in the film is the final minutes, which are one of my favorite suspenseful sequences, which is also one of my favorite stealth attack battles, as it pretty much a one-on-one -on -one where Jerry has to not just find the blue sunshine person in the department store, but he has to successfully trank him, and he only has one shot to do it. So God forbid he is spotted, but also that he even remotely misses. Come to think of it, is that maybe kind of a, uh, what's, what's the word, like a char character arc kind of thing? Because in a lot of the movie, Zippy is very excitable, but here at the end, it's extremely important that he is completely calm and focused. So when he actually does manage to, to hit you know, to, yeah, that is actually, a, and I also saw someone point out that it's, um, let's see, yeah, you know, the, the, that basically Zippy is the, the kind of, you know, the, he is the hippie who never settled down, you know, we're told he had 10 different jobs in five years, and, you know, he, there's something about his living situation I don't remember. I'm sorry. Now, let's see. Right. But I really like the cinematography and just the tense contained atmosphere. Almost reminds me of certain sequences in the video game Resident Evil where you're just not sure where the danger is and it could pop out at any moment away from your sight. I really like the ending, which really gave me a cold chill. I won't say what it is, but it shows we could only be seeing the tip of the iceberg. See, I think that's exactly the, the way you're supposed to... Look, the movie could end with, like, us seeing a bunch of different people being... Like, a quick montage of people being arrested. And then, you know, brief, like, scene there at the end where, you know, Zippy is talking to this DEA guy. And it's like, you're absolutely sure. And the guy responds, yes, we have every single batch of Blue Sunshine accounted for. None of them are still out there, and the ones we have, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna keep them locked up. This, you know, Blue Sunshine will never hurt anyone again. You know, yeah, that could they could have ended the movie like that, but that wasn't what it was. I I love that it is just you know just the tip of the iceberg. Just imagine watching this movie and then going home, and like thinking that any moment someone you care about could snap and kill people they care about, maybe kill you, you know, that's just, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, this person also points out, in addition to the pacing being uneven, the various narrative threads sometimes dangle. Also, suspense doesn't really build because the, this, despite the pregnant premise, maybe because the threads too often meander rather than build. 
I wouldn't go quite that far, but I do definitely see some of what they mean by that, yeah. I'm sorry, this is kind of funny. Jerry Zipkin, ineptly played by Zalman King, spends most of the film delivering his lines like he has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just... Yeah, yeah, kind of. It is it is like a... Yeah. Yeah, some people really hate Zippy because uh, how, you know, what a frustrating character he is. Yeah, and, and this bit from, a you know, once again, as I say, you know, don't, don't harass one of these reviewers. I'm not, you know. Yeah. Excuse me. But I do just want to briefly Yeah, so this this person this reviewer says, I mean seriously, if I'm not repeating that word, if a blue sunshiner is after you, who has time to recite a prose about how to shoot? It's to focus, to make sure he doesn't mess it up, since it could mean his death and possibly many others. Since Jerry won't be there to stop the blue sunshiners or convince the cops about it, it's it's a it's one of the rare occasions where using a gun is actually realistically depicted in an American movie. Like you have to actually focus very carefully, and it just I just I just have to wonder if this person would like you know pr prefers the scenes where people just magically have incredible aim and don't seem like they have to focus that much to shoot properly now let's see And yeah, so the yeah, so so this reviewer, you know, said they knew that you know ex hippies were going to kill people in this movie, and you know, yeah, when this movie was made, renting movies wasn't really a thing, so they didn't know that it would be described as that when they made it. I will admit that it's hard to sell a movie in a few words without giving that away, but it's really not the filmmaker's fault. And, okay, yeah, so this person... Yeah, never mind. I'm not going to quote them directly. I don't want anyone to, like, seek them out and harass them, but... And once again, just please, if, if you, I don't want anyone watching my videos to go harassing people that I say I don't like, regardless of who they are, and just, if you feel like harassing someone that I criticize in a video, then I really don't want you to watch my videos. I. I don't want someone how you know I'm, I'm not saying that I can somehow stop people from harassing but I am saying if you at all respect me don't harass the people that I criticize I'm not that's not what I want to do I want to criticize ideas I don't want people to get harassed but yeah some some people say that the movie isn't unique and it's just like really like I, even if I hated this movie, I would still, I, I can't imagine how do you get to 
calling this movie not unique. Now, let's see. Okay, so that is it. Okay, so I have gone through all of my notes. Let's see if there's anything final before I have been going for almost three hours now. Okay, let's see. I guess. Um, let me think. I'm not saying that the movie, you know, if I hadn't already made it clear, I'm not saying this is like a flawless movie, you know. This is not The Terminator. This is not Rosemary's Baby or like, okay, maybe Rosemary's Baby isn't completely flawless. But there are movies out there that I'm not sure I would change anything about. I'm not saying I wouldn't change anything about this movie, but I do think that despite its weaknesses, it works incredibly well. I, like I said, I've watched it three times now, and even the first time I knew, you know, as I was watching the mystery unfold, I knew what the answer was going to turn out to be, because that's why I bought the movie. I wanted to, you know, the, the idea of LSD making former hippies go berserk you know, seemed appealing to me that, that I was like, I gotta watch that. That sounds interesting, you know, and even so I was all three times that I've watched it, keeping in mind that, you know, I really hadn't forgotten very much about this movie at all. You know, so, so both the second and third times I knew almost exactly what was coming and it was still just, it, I find it fairly gripping, and I will definitely say that it would be even better if it was just a little bit more focused, and if the... I, I do, I think, I legitimately do think the performance and character, sometimes characterization, of Zippy is a bad element of the film, and the film would be better if the... Yeah. I did see someone say that, you know, they didn't think he was interesting enough of a character. I don't think he's... I, I don't think the character needs to be interesting when the concept is so interesting. I don't think every every movie needs to have that deeply compelling of a protagonist. You know, I've seen... I think it was Cracked who pointed out that, for example, Neo in The Matrix by himself really isn't all that interesting. He's a he's an audience avatar. You know, he's easy for you to project yourself into, onto something like that. I feel like this is one of those things. The the concept I'm I'm not saying you can't have both, you know, but this doesn't need both is what I'm saying. And I don't think that the movie needed for him to be more interesting, but it definitely would have been better. It would have been a better movie if his performance was not so... It's either over the top... I, I gotta admit, I, I find it kind of weird when some of them say, oh, he's just always scowling. I mean, he's not always scowling, but he's either scowling or shouting. That I agree with. You know, he's the... the wait, do I... Am I thinking of another word than scowling? I just feel... Isn't scowling... Doesn't that have to... Oh, wait, no, never mind. I guess scowling does fit. I retract my... Yes. So, I do think that he needed to... He needed to not... All... He's, he's either over the... He's he's way up here, or he's really down here. And it, they needed to find a, a better... They needed to find a middle ground for him to stay in for a lot of the movie. It's fine for him to get super excited at times, but it really, yeah, and I think maybe the, the, you know, maybe some of the credibility issues, I think the movie would be better, I, I think it was an independent film thing that he didn't, you know, they didn't have the money to portray the, the, you know, to, to basically, like, all the time have Zippy 
hiding from the police. You know, I mean, he does. He throughout this movie, he behaves as someone who's not being hunted. He's way too much out in public. You know, I I think ultimately the reason for it is that, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, but I'll I'll repeat here for clarity. The way I see it, I think the idea is that if Zippy could just go to the police, then why wouldn't he always just that? Like, hypothetically, imagine if the police believed him and he went to the police and said, if I could have, if, if like one or two cops could follow me, I know where there might be someone dangerous. You know, I can save lives if you'll let a couple of cops come with me. So he goes to Wendy's. Sorry, I, I have to resist the urge to make a joke about the fast food. Yeah. He goes to Wendy Babysitter's place with two cops. You know, I mean, at that point, either they, you know, put her in cuffs and she's not going to be able to break out of them once she snaps or she's already snapped and they shoot her and that's it. You know, but it's really exciting when Zippy is alone in there and trying to, you know, like, either wrestle the knife from her or, or something, you know, and he manages to launch her off the, the balcony. And and that's just, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I guess maybe Lieberman didn't fully think through what the, the whole, you know, wanted by the cops thing would mean, or I, I don't know. But I do think that the movie... It, it could have been a better movie if the credibility... I think the movie would be absolutely... Would be, would be just... I already love it, but I think it could be even better. And yes, I realize that when I say I love it, it, it doesn't leave a lot of room for it being even better. But if the only thing in the movie that felt absurd and ridiculous and out there if that was the only thing sorry if the only thing that was that was the effects of blue sunshine because then it would be i mean it already is most other things are credible but there are a couple of things like the the him being wanted for murder and you know i don't i mean his behavior excuse me isn't in and of itself it's it's consistent enough that it's just that's who he is. Excuse me. His behavior is not, you know, he's he's a there are some people who just if they end up if they're in a stressful situation where they have to prove that they're not doing anything wrong, they're going to get really anxious and accidentally do things that make people think they're doing something wrong. And he's one of them. You know, so so and I, Sometimes when I say things like that, I worry that it comes off as if I don't have empathy. I'm not saying that there's something inherently wrong with you if you are someone. I don't think I'm very good at, you know, proving that I'm like, you know, so, but, but the, but the, the, the idea that he's being wanted by the police and yet he can still move so freely. We almost never see police, you know anywhere even though supposedly he's you know a wanted murderer you know no one no one even you know and, and only there at the very end does his like apparently they start talking about on tv that he killed wendy but only there at the end like they suspected him from the very start of the movie like by the end i think a couple of days have passed at least why wouldn't he have been on tv the whole time if they thought he killed Franny and I mean and they think he killed the three women at Franny's house as well so they think he's a serial killer and they're not gonna put all the information out and, and try to get no it's just it just doesn't really it's very hard to believe and it's it's a frustrating element I think the movie would be nearly perfect if the only thing at all the only thing that we could uh, that that was hard to believe was the effects of blue sunshine if if it legitimately just completely you know because at the end of the day i feel like 
I, I don't think that Starship Troopers, I swear I'm not going to dive too deep right now, but I feel like Starship Troopers, they managed to refine it to a point where almost everything that's in that movie specifically services the the things they're trying to say and, and make fun of and, and, you know, satirize and such. There's, I, I'm not, I don't think I off the top of my head could come up with, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything I could say about that movie that I feel is legitimately, okay. If I had to say one bad thing about that movie, at the end of the day, Casper Van Dien, if that's how you pronounce it, is not that compelling. He's not that convincing. And I get that he's the, the attractive kind of, but there are other attractive actors who could have done it, who would also be more, like, he's his acting is just, uh, you know, it's not great. And, yeah, I, I feel like the movie would have been even better if the, the instead of Casper Van Dien, it was someone who was, um, you know, but that's basically it, you know, and with, and, and it's not, I don't, I don't remember it as being that big of a problem for the movie. Here, at the end of the day, it's not that big of a problem for me personally, but it's, you know, it's a big problem for other people, and I don't blame them. It's just, the good things in this movie are so powerful that they overpower almost all of the bad things for me, you know, so, but yeah, the, the fact that almost the only out there hard to believe thing almost is the the what's it called the effects of blue sunshine and thus that's what you kind of focus in on you're like that makes no sense how would that even work you know and yeah so the i think that it, yeah so i'm just very briefly before i cut transmission i'm going to show so we got let's see i'm not 100 percent certain but i think that either is wendy or is supposed to be wendy and we've got now that's definitely her on the disc that's her after she's been oops, there that's her after she's been you know after, yeah Defenestrated? No, wait, there's no window involved, sorry. And it's, since it's not Puma Man, there's no refenestration either. And that's her down there. Her again. Well, you know, it's her. And finally, and see this, I mean, here they did sexualize her in a way that the movie doesn't really I mean this is the only it's the only scene that it could be from it's she's the only character that it could be but yeah and it really is like the 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 idea of have you know struggling to keep someone from stabbing you that I mean that that in and of itself is already really scary but imagine that it's someone that you had a conversation with just two minutes prior. You know, just I mean, maybe four minutes, but something like that. It's just they had a natural conversation. Well, as natural as any that Zippy en engages in once he's, you know, yeah. But the, the and, and she's just suddenly, stabbed. And, and it's not like he could talk her down. There's no... You know, it's it's impossible to to stop them other than trank or kill, and yeah, I, you know the the most scary stuff is the stuff that's hardest to believe, which is unfortunately also something you know it's, it's a it's a difficult balance because you have to make it so impossible to believe that it's scary, but not so impossible to believe that you as an audience member are going, but that doesn't make sense. So it's yeah. I really don't envy people telling horror stories. I've, you know, I've made a few horror short, short movies in the horror genre, and I am no longer working within that. I, I really don't envy anyone having to try to tell a, you know, a big 
horror story today because there's just there's you know there there's such the the expectations are really difficult to yeah however that is everything i had to say so i hope you enjoyed watching as i enjoyed watching and recording and i will catch you next time